Hi, my name is David Brown and I'm 31 years old. My middle name is Jesse. And I want to talk to you today about something that happened when I was 24. Um, when I was 24 years old, I was framed for disciplinary matters by WSU. And I was also given undeserved bad grades and harassed by my professors and certain other students. Um, and this all happened within the WSU MBA program, the full-time on-campus MBA program. And um, like I said, I was harassed by all my professors of that program. And I was harassed by most of the students that were in that program. And um, on top of the undeserved bad grades, I was also illegally fired from a tuition waiving job. Um, so anyways, um, I was targeted for all these matters because I'm Jewish. WSU was racially discriminating across the entire MBA program, and they targeted me because I was the one and only Jew in the program. And I'm going to get into, um, everything, uh, here in a moment. Um, but first I need to, uh, discuss, uh, one thing you're probably noticing right now, you're probably noticing that this video is three hours long or about three hours long. And, um, I understand that's a long period of time, but the reality is that, uh, in order to prove a frame, you really need to have a comprehensive approach. That's just the way that you, you have to deal with it. Um, because, uh, uh to claim that something was, uh, just a frame, it's a bold, thing to say. So you really have to go through all parts of the case and you have to go through all parts of it in order to um, tell the audience everything they need to know. Because if there's a part of the case that you're not talking about, then the audience may think, well, maybe that part of it was real. So it's just the nature of, of um, you know, discussing a frame. Um, you have to prove that all parts of it were the result of a frame. So um, anyway, so in addition to this, uh, video that's about three hours, you'll also see, um, on my Facebook page, you'll see the, uh, student conic file from the case. And you'll also see an annotated version of that student conic file. And, um, I did all that annotation. I wrote all those notes and, um, yeah, um, so I'll go through, you know, each each part of that file and debunk it all. So you can read all um, all the annotation and there's also a non annotated version. So you can look through it without the notes as well. Um, you'll also find the trial transcript. So I'm posting that on uh, my Facebook page as well, along with all this other stuff. Um, and you'll also see a uh, video that's approximately 30 minutes. And in that video, I go through a few of the Facebook messages that were in the student conic file and all the commentary you hear in that video is me. Um, um, it was done by me, that is. And you'll also see a declaration. Um, everything that I'm telling you in this video that's about three hours, as well as everything I, all the, uh, all, everything I told you in the annotated student conic file and the annotation there and in the commentary on that video that's approximately 30 minutes, everything I'm telling you is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you'll also be able to see a declaration that everything that I'm telling you in this uh, video that's about three hours and, and um, the other things that I mentioned here in this exoneration uh, process um, that everything that I'm telling you is true under penalty of perjury. Um, so everything that you're going to hear in this three hour video is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And that goes for, you know, everything I said in the commentary on that video, that's approximately 30 minutes and in the annotation in student conic file. And you'll also see in that declaration, I verify the authenticity of everything that I'm providing to you. So, you know, that that's really the student conic file. That's really the trial transcript um, as provided by WSU and, you know, so forth. 
um, and that those Facebook messages were the real Facebook messages. And um, so you have all the reason in the world to believe me. Um, so anyways, let's get into the flaws of the case. Now, you're probably noticing as you look through that uh, student conic file, there wasn't a single use of the web form in my case at all. Um, WSU did not use the web form. Um, there is um, a web page for a web, a part of the website of WSU's website for the Office of Student Conduct. And in that, um, they, they, in that part of the website, they have a web form. And those web forms are used to collect um, allegations of violations of the Student Conduct Code. And WSU had that web form the whole time that I was in graduate school. They even had that web form um, during my years in, the under, in undergrad. Um, and, um, They've always, so they've always used a, a web form. Um, the web form, I guess, has changed a little bit over the years, but it's actually gotten worse because <laughs> since I've made so many arguments on social media bringing up the fact that the web form wasn't used, uh, since I was in graduate school, they've actually made it less comprehensive than it used to be. It actually even ha it used to ask for even more information, and it used to display uh, the IP address of whoever was visiting the page at the time, and it used to have much more daunting disclaimers and ask for more information than it does now. But either way, the point is that um, WSU had a web form the entire time that I was in graduate school, and they didn't use it one bit. Uh, instead, what they, what they were using um, was just emails. They were having students report their matters uh, through email, alleging all these violations of the student conduct code through email and other unsworn statements. They were deliberately avoiding the use of the web form, and you can tell because um, of the fact that, um, you know, there's no use of it, and it's not, it, there's no explanation for there not being any use of it at, at all. And you can also look in the wordings of the emails. You can tell that there was correspondence beforehand. Um, in a lot of the emails. And um, for example, you hear, uh, it, you can see in the Evan Heary email that's that was ostensibly sent on April 1st, 2010 uh, at 4.33 p.m. First of all, notice the time. Uh, the time was long after the class took place. So there, there was plenty of time to conspire, but you also see, um, you know, you could tell by the wording of it that there was correspondence beforehand. And um, it's just, um, you know, ridiculous to try and believe that it was anything other than a contrivance that they were asking these students to um, turn in emails instead of the, uh, uh, using the web form. When you look at the, um, the Evan Harry email to Christian Withridge that was ostensibly sent on Tuesday, March 30th, 2010 at 5.34 p.m. Um, you could see it explicitly stated, it says, thanks for meeting with me last week, below is my statement. So you could tell they were communicating beforehand before these students send these emails. And then they use these emails as their official reports. And it even says uh, down below in the, that same email, it says formal, formal complaint about David Brown. So it's like um, they were clearly telling these students to do this. And um, basically, as um, you surely can tell, I mean, they were obviously avoiding the web form because they were lying. They were um, enabling the students and others to turn in false statements. Now, you're probably noticing that um, uh, someone could still get in trouble for lying, even if they reported it through an email. And that's true. And that's why I believe that um, the primary like uh, tactic of WSU in, in using those uh, emails and other unsworn statements instead of the web form was to coax the students into doing it. Because think about it. These are graduate students. These are people who hope to have a future. So WSU was able to tell them, 
oh, no, 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 you don't need to fill out that web form. You'll get in trouble if you do it that way. You don't need to do that. You'll, you could get in trouble. Just send me a little email and, uh, you know, say whatever you want. You can lie and we'll redact your names. We'll protect you. You'll be fine that way. So it served as a way to coax the students into doing it. Um, another uh, uh, tactic um, of WSUs in doing that was that it enabled them to leave out a lot of information. Um, those web forms um, and uh, th those web forms um, have like a certification of truth. They, they make you go through some steps before submitting it to agree that what you are saying must be true. And obviously email doesn't uh, have that. Uh, they could just send them. So it's a little less daunting. Um, as I was mentioning, it helped WSU coax the students into doing it, but it also enables them to leave out all these details um, like that would normally have gone into those fields that those web forms require you to fill out, such as where did this take place? Um, was this in a class? If so, what class? Give us the classroom number. Who was teaching the class at the time? Now, if they would have been required to say that, they would have had to say, in many cases, Todd 109, because that's the main MBA classroom. That was the MBA classroom, and that's where the majority of our classes took place. And that room has a cam had a camera in it. It had a video camera in it the whole time I was in graduate school. And um, then there would have been all these listings of Todd 109, and the defendant can go, look, you're not presenting any of the video evidence, even though you're saying right here that this happened in that room. Um, and also, you know, many times in their email allegations, they weren't even stating what professor was teaching the class at the time. And I had 10 separate professors while I was in graduate school. So um, if, if all these allegations were true, um, some of those professors would have seen some things. And if they were filling out the web form, they would have had to say those professors' names. And um, then there would have been just a laundry list of missing witnesses you know where where is your statement from the professor on this matter did you even investigate with them um, why aren't you bringing them forward to testify uh, things like that so it enabled the students to kind of leave out a lot of the details that would have exposed the holes in their story it enabled them to pick and choose what to say um, an interesting example of that was uh, if you look at the Ashley Fagerly personal statement um, you can tell that uh, she So she claimed that at about 11.59 a.m., she was sitting inside of a seat in a classroom, and a class was about to begin in that classroom at 12 noon. And how many people do you think would be in a college classroom at, ele at about 11.59 a.m. when a class is about to begin in that room at 12 noon. You would think there would have been dozens of people just sitting around attentively, quietly, just kind of looking around, waiting for the class to begin. Um, and she never stated a single name of a person who saw that event. She was claiming that it was a rub on her shoulder. It was not. It was a tap on the shoulder. But she was lying and saying that it was a rub. Now, if she would have had to say who was, a, who was around her when it happened, who was sitting near her? Who could have seen it? Who did see it? Who may have seen it? Things like that. Um, you know, there would have been all these um, missing witness inferences and um, it would have exposed the, the flaws in her story because obviously I did not rub her shoulder, which is why WSU suppressed the exonerating evidence of that video because this was in Todd 109 when the shoulder touch happened, which was just a tap, not a rub. WSU didn't even show the video of it and they claimed that it was you know touching her in, a, in an inappropriate way as you can tell by the uh you know like the fact that they charged me uh for that um with a violation of the university rules for that um and um <laughs> You know, Ash Fagley claimed she felt violated and WSU said she was crying and shaking, but they never told us who was around her, who would have seen it, who would have, you know, saw what happened. And of course, there was people who saw what happened. It's just that they saw what David was saying, not what Ashley was saying. So, um, you know, avoiding the web form also, I mean, it, it all boils down to allowing the students to lie and allowing others to lie too. But, um, 
if you think about the specifics of it, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, you know, like actually never said who saw it, who was even, she never even said who was around her at the time that we could talk to, to see what's their side of the story, to see if they would corroborate Ashley's story or my story. Um, because they wanted to leave that out. They wanted to leave that information out. They probably even told her, don't say that information because they knew that she was lying because they were, they were just taking a benign event a shoulder tap and enhancing it by adding details saying it was a rub another um interesting thing um that uh a web form would have asked for would have been who did these alleged events happen to if you look at the evan harry email um on what was ostensibly sent on uh tuesday march 30th 2010 5 34 p.m uh that same one i mentioned uh, a, moment, a moment ago uh, you look through it and he's often just saying somebody, he's just saying something happened to somebody. It just happened to some person. He says, two students had to share coughed into the student's face, forces people out of the way, touched a female classmate's hair after she found out she was upset. Um, he unknowingly and two a classmates about two months ago, two female classmates. You can tell that they told him, don't say any names, just um, say whatever you want to say. That way you can lie about it. And um, we would have no way to know um, whether anything he's saying is true. And it's not true, by the way. But we would have no way to be able to check that these things even happened and be able to talk to the people. Um, and where, where would they be? If these things happened, where are they? You know what I mean? It was just a, a big opportunity for them to lie. And also, uh, the web forms ask, um, did you talk to police? Have you talked to police yet? And if so, what is the police report number? And um, there was no police reports at all made a part of the trial. Um, so it's just really ridiculous to think that um, you know, these things would have even been remotely close to being true, yet there would be no police reports at all in the student chronic file, and there wasn't. They didn't even give us a police report number. Um, it, it was ridiculous. Um, so the students didn't have to say information like that in their emails either. Um, and uh, another thing to notice is that the web form submissions probably go into a database where um, the, probably the whole Office of Student Conduct, the Attorney General's Office, the Ombudsman, and probably even the President's Office at WSU um, can view the submissions. Whereas an email just goes from like somebody to somebody or, you know, somebody to a couple of people or something like that. And, um, you know, through an email, they can, with those emails, they could probably delete them. Whereas with the web form submissions, they're probably inside that database and there is probably secure. You probably can't even delete something from it. And with an email, they can, you know, alter it before forwarding it or alter it before printing it with, but maybe with the, the web form submission database, you maybe can't do that. So it also enabled them to pick and choose who at the university would be involved with the uh, frame and also, you know, um, have a less secure environment. Um, then, you know, they probably even deleted their emails after sending them, um, the, you know, the students and the other, uh, reporter, uh, uh, reporters, the claimants. Um, and so, um, as you can see, the absence of the web form was, uh, pretty important. Um, and as I said, as I as I'd stated, um, there is no use of police reports at all in the student conic file. There wasn't any police reports. And even in Ashley Faculty's personal statement, she stated that uh, she filed a police report and they never even made it a part of the student conduct trial or the student conduct file. And, you know, if what they were saying was even remotely close to being true, um, you would have seen those police reports. Uh, they didn't even give us a police report number, as I said. Um, there, there is no police report at all in the student conic file or at all part of the trial. Uh, they just completely left them out. 
uh, which tells you uh, that it was obviously a frame because if what they were saying was true, they would have been able to show those. Whatever was in them was obviously bad for WSU and good for the defendant. Um, so as you, as you notice, virtually everything that WSU used against me was hearsay and um, a very um, egregious uh, form of that was the undated narrative by Cheryl Oliver. If you take a look at that undated narrative, it was it was really ridiculous because they obviously just had her write it right before trial um, and just make up a whole bunch of stuff. And you can tell that they were just having her write down things to cover all the holes in WSU's case. Um, for example, like the finance exam event, they knew they weren't going to produce the uh, video evidence from that room, even though the, the exam took place in Todd 109. And the video would have shown um, the professor not approaching me until the third time that I was leaving, as I said. Um, he and he would have he you would the video would have shown him not paying any attention at all to the first two times I went to the bathroom because we were adults the, he let us they all let us go to the bathroom without asking permission and um, it wasn't until the third time that he approached me in the doorway to say something and that video would have shown it and WSU knew they weren't going to produce the video because they were lying about that it was a frame and they also knew they weren't going to bring forward that professor to testify because they were lying and it was a frame so. Uh, they just had Cheryl Oliver write in her notes that she was in a meeting and she heard Harry Turtle say what happened. And um, it's funny because the, uh, you know, she, so she's saying Harry Turtle told her what happened at an event that she didn't even witness. And then they're relying on that as their evidence. They're just saying, they, they obviously just had her write that down. And then they point to that and say, oh, look, it happened. Here's our evidence of it. That proves it. It's like, no, you obviously just asked her to write that. And now you're just pointing at that as your evidence. And um, it's really funny to think about the undated narrative because Cheryl Oliver was the program advisor. Um, she was the MBA advisor. She advised us students. And... Um, she wasn't in any of the classes. She didn't witness any of the events. Um, so it's like, what good is she? Um, it, it just it just didn't make any sense. She was often just saying what other people told her, what other people saw. She was often talking about what other people saw or what other people heard. And it's like, well, you didn't witness this. You weren't in the classes. What do you know? And the same thing goes for David Sprott. You know, he was the dean of the program and he like testified against me and he's like, you're talking about all this stuff, but ultimately it's hilarious because he wasn't even there. He wasn't even in the classes. He didn't witness these events. What does he know? You know, so um, at the time, it kind of like, you know, they kind of pulled the wool over my eyes because at the time, you know, it seems kind of, you know, like, oh man, a dean testified against him. Oh man, it means so much, you know, <laughs> and I, you know. Uh, the program advisor wrote this stuff, but then, you, you know, you look at it from a legal perspective and it is so absurd because these people didn't witness the things they're talking about. They're telling us what other people told them and they're talking about what other people saw, what other people heard. And it's, um, it's just absurd. It, it was, it's so stupid to really, to really stop and think about. And, um, obviously, you know, as, as I said, the undated narrative was an, an unsworn statement, just like the Ashley Faggerly personal statement. And um, the rest of it, the rest of the case against me was just emails. Uh, so it was just absolutely ridiculous. It was a total frame. And you'll also notice as you look through the uh, student conic file and the transcript that there was a, a total lack of meaningful evidence in the case. They didn't have anything. They didn't have anything at all. Um, they didn't have any evidence that proved what they were saying. They didn't have any meaningful evidence at all. The only person who tried to bring meaningful evidence into the case was me. I brought the MIS 580 recording to the trial. They didn't even let me play it. They didn't even take a copy of the of the file for themselves and the and the record. And I br see I brought that uh, audio recording on the laptop. So I brought the original 
audio file, the original recording on the original hard drive it was created on, the original item, it is the golden piece of evidence. It's the best evidence a trial could ever want, the original audio recording of what they claimed was such an important event. And um, it was on the original hard disk that it was created on. It was the golden piece of evidence. And they deliberately suppressed that evidence because it was exonerating. And um, that was the only person, I'm the only person who tried to get meaningful evidence into that trial and they didn't even allow it. The, the trial, uh, the whole case didn't ha had a total lack of meaningful evidence. It didn't have any meaningful evidence. Um, and um, of course there was uh, evidence missing in places where it would have been if what WC was saying was true, such as video evidence. The Todd 109 uh, classroom had a video camera in it and um, the video camera was pointing at the whole classroom. And they didn't present any video evidence even though the majority of our classes took place in that room. Um, and the Ashley Fagley shoulder touch happened in front of that camera. It, the shoulder that I tapped, not rubbed, the shoulder that was touched was um, facing that camera. It was the, the shoulder that was facing that camera. They didn't even present the video evidence of it because that evidence was exonerating. And um, there, you know, they had claimed that there was all these phone calls to, to women and it was so, you know, bizarre or something. And uh, they never produced any phone records to show what they were saying. They didn't have anything that proved that or even came remotely close to proving it. They didn't have any meaningful evidence at all. There were no um, phone records. There was one voicemail that they showed, but they didn't even show the voicemail itself. They showed their own transcription of it, and the transcription wasn't even accurate. They didn't even give us the actual uh, voicemail. Uh, but And there was, there was no phone records other than that to show like multiple calls from a guy to some girl that's not his girlfriend or to anybody in any kind of way that would show anything. They didn't show any phone records um, because I didn't do what they were saying I did. I didn't call people at all, not women, not anybody in any kind of bizarre way. And, um, you know, they claim that there was like emails and Facebook messages and the, the few things that they do present, you know, um, you see a few like snapshots of some Facebook uh, messages and you look at them and number one, there isn't anything in there. There's no violation of rule or law or even something that comes close to that in there. They didn't have any meaningful evidence and they didn't have the amount of them they were uh, purporting that they that had occurred. They didn't they didn't have um, evidence to prove that there was a lot of contact, as they said. They didn't have any evidence to even come close to that. Um, I was in that program for eight months. So if the best they can come up with was just a few messages that really didn't have anything in there that was bad at all, um, they, you know, they really didn't have a good case. And um, another thing that's interesting was that um, there was no lecture recordings um, at all in the case. And I, I don't just mean for the one that they, you know, suppressed of mine, but of other students, the other, uh, WSU was claiming and Evan Harry stated, and even Ashley Fagley had stated in her testimony, she said she, she had heard about David's outbursts, um, in class. And, uh, you know, Evan was saying that I was saying irrelevant, bizarre statements and somewhat ominous statements in the classes that, uh, over the time he was taking classes with me, which was, about seven months and we were in the same classes together all the same classes together we were both fall 2009 mbas and um people who started in fall 2009 that is we were in all the same classes and none of these other students generated a, a lecture recording for the trial and you would think that um if i was uh, i'm about at i'm getting close to 30 minutes uh i'm about at 30 minutes that is so i'll see you in the next video Hi. Um, so, like I was saying, um, there was a lack of meaningful evidence, and on the topic of the you know other students um, creating lecture recordings, um, they didn't create any that I know of, and they didn't have any evidence of what they were saying. They didn't introduce any lecture recordings into the trial, and you would think um, that after seven months 
of a full-time MBA program taking classes with these people, if what they were saying was true, that I was honestly saying those, you know, irrelevant, bizarre, ominous statements as they were claiming, um, you would think that at some point, somebody in those classes would have uh, thought of the idea to record a lecture. Laptops were required for that program. And we had our laptops out and running during the majority of the time we were in that program. So it's ridiculous to think that what they were saying would have been true if there wasn't a single bit of that um, recorded that they could present. Um, my best bet is that um, some of those uh, lecture recordings might have existed, but not for the reason you think, only because it was an MBA program. And so you might end up recording a lecture anyway just to do well in school. Uh, but they didn't have any evidence of me doing anything, um, which is why you never saw a single bit of evidence like that at all or anything other that was any other kind of evidence that was meaningful. Um, WSU didn't have any kind of real evidence um, against me. They didn't have anything meaningful at all. And, uh, you know, recording a lecture would be just rational in a situation like that because, um, you know, when I, I, I did something like that, I, I recorded lectures when I saw other people breaking rules. You know, I created audio recordings because I was being harassed by my professors. I was being harassed by the students in the program. The school wasn't stopping it. So I had a laptop in front of me because the laptops were required for the program. And I did what any rational human would do. I hit record. <laughs> and if I was saying things in those classes I shouldn't have been saying or um, anything like that, then somebody at some point would have thought of the idea of recording a lecture um, and they never had any evidence of what they were saying. And you would think they would have done that if I was actually doing anything like they were saying. And um, so as... Um, you know, I've also stated there was, you know, suppression of exonerating evidence, the MIS 580 recording, um, which was a recording of um, the professor, K.D. Joshi. Um, I mean, it was it was a recording of the whole lecture. Um, but during that lecture, the professor, K.D. Joshi, was severely harassing me and even harassing me over the topic that they were framing me and harassing me over the topic that they were giving me undeserved bad grades. They were harassing me over those things. And um, you even hear a lot of the other students harassing me as well and saying that they were uh, participating in the frame and they were harassing me about you know the emails that they were sending and the lies they were telling and how they didn't think they would get caught. And, um, you know, then I, I had said something back. I said that they were killing an innocent man and that they were stupid for thinking they'd get away with it. And it's just really wrong what they were doing. And then they used that, um, statement, uh, to false, they falsely reported it and said that, um, since the word kill was technically in there, they said they falsely reported it as a threat, which is why, uh, they didn't report it properly. There was no police report. And, um, uh, they suppressed the exonerating evidence of the MIS 580 recording, and they didn't bring forward the professor to testify, and um, they didn't get any kind of official statement from the professor, and, um, you know, much more. Um, and uh, so they were suppressing <laughs> exonerating evidence. And... Um, you know, even after I had said that that one comment, Katie Joshi followed it up with further harassment, saying that WC frames people all the time and this is nothing new. And um, she even included a few anti-Semitic comments. And um, again, I'm under I'm under penalty of perjury saying this. OK, this this recording exists. And um, if it is legal for me to share it with you, I will share it. I, I distributed uh, not only that recording, but other lecture recordings um, through my uh, Facebook page and hundreds of people downloaded it. I can uh, tell through the uh, Mediafire account that I used to disseminate them that hundreds of people downloaded those those files. So um, you know, many people have them and you may have them if it is legal for me to, to share them. Um, so, 
uh, just if, if there is a legal setting where I can share those recordings of WSU lectures, I will share them. I would assume that I would need WSU's permission to do so before doing it in most situations, um, which they obviously would never provide. Um, but if there is a setting where I can provide it legally to you, it's not, not only that is yours, but anything, <laughs> any of the evidence is yours. Cause I really was framed. I really am innocent. Um, the truth is on my side. So, um, on the topic of the suppression of exonerating evidence, um, WSU also suppressed, as I said, the video evidence from the Todd 109 classroom. Now, you're probably wondering, why was there a video camera in the Todd 109 classroom, the MBA classroom? Well, um, the ostensible reason would be that it was because it, it, was a, it was an expensive classroom. It was the MBA classroom, and it was the flagship classroom for the business school. It had a swipe card entry. The door wouldn't open unless you swiped your um, graduate school ID card. So it only would open for the MBAs. I imagine it also opened for not, of course, also the professors, not only the professors, but also it would also it would open for probably deans of the business school and MBA administrative employees like Cheryl Oliver, Laura Tomley, and Yoshio Smith, you know, and anyone else who would be relevant to the program. And uh, inside was very nice office chairs for all of us, um, nice tables, furniture, stuff like that. Um, and there was a drop down projector that came out of the ceiling and the professors had like a projection screen that automatically came down and, um, you know, they could plug their laptop into technology that would, you know, go through the projector and project their screen up there. They also had the thing where it had a camera above a writing area and it would project what they were writing uh, by using a digital camera or, um, you know, a, I don't know the term, whatever that kind of camera would be that those, uh, those um, devices use. Um, but anyway, um, it was an expensive classroom, and that would be the ostensible reason that the uh, uh, video camera was there. Probably, the, the, I mean, probably the real reason, or at least an, uh, a secondary reason it was there was because probably David Sprott likes to have video and audio recordings of Jews being harassed. Um, so he probably, you know, enjoys having footage from his Jewish harassment chamber. Um, and, uh, so that was, uh, you know, that's, that's why a camera was there and not a single bit of video footage was, was used. Um, and of course it would have been used if what WCU was saying was true. So it was definitely a frame. Um, another flaw in the case was that there was a missing member of the jury. There was a missing juror. Um, if you look at the charging documents, you could tell that the trial was supposed to have four jurors and, um, then Lisa McIntyre as the university student conduct board chair, AKA the judge. And, um, they're, you know, a student conduct officer, um, AKA a, a prosecutor. So it was supposed to have six people other than the witnesses and the defendant. Um, instead they only had three jurors and you can tell if you look at the um, trial transcript, you can tell that there was there was a missing juror, and um, WSU never even brought it up. They continued with the trial anyway. They never said a single word about it. And uh, Roger Sandberg, my corrupt Pullman attorney, didn't even bring it up on appeal. He didn't even mention it, and that's obviously a, a gigantic flaw that you would want to bring up on appeal. You know, if twenty five percent of the jury is not even there, uh, you would think that that would be you know worthy of mentioning. Um, and, um, also, um, I was going to mention, uh, the reason for the, you wondered why I stopped at 30 minutes and started at, uh, again, at, you know, 30 minutes is I'm doing this in 30 minute intervals because as you probably know, uh, video cameras, because of some sort of European law, um, they make video cameras, uh, with a 30 minute recording cap. Um, so, um, I'm just going to do 30 minute videos and then link them together until it's about three hours. Um, so anyway, 
Um, so another flaw in the case was that, as I said, there was 10 separate professors, none of which testified at the trial and none of which offered a statement through the web form. As I said, there was no use of the web form, but listen to this. Um, according to WAC 504-26-401, any member of the university community may file a complaint against a student for violations of the standards of conduct for students. So even a professor could have used the web form. Anybody could have. Deans, MBA advisor, anybody, and none of them did. They all deliberately avoided the use of the web form. And, um, you know, WSU had claimed that Cheryl Oliver was out of town and they, and Harry Turtle told me that, oh, he's too busy. Um, first of all, the, tr the trial was held on, on a, at 5.30 uh, p.m. on a Thursday in Pullman on April 8th. You know, um, where would anybody be on a Thursday evening in Pullman? Pullman's a small college town in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's, it's, you're not going anywhere on a Thursday, on a Thursday evening in Pullman. Um, and uh, as you could probably guess, uh, they were probably lying about anybody, any of those witnesses being too busy or out of town. They were probably just lying. However, um, as also, as you know, um, even if any of them were out of town, WSU was probably making them out of town or too busy on purpose, which, as you know, is illegal. You can't just intentionally make sure a witness is out of town or too busy um, and just to avoid a trial. That's illegal. And um, also, even if they, they did have um, what we could call like naturally occurring plans or um, what's a better term? Um, legitimate plans, that's probably better, instead of illegitimate plans, that legitimate plans, um, even if they did have plans before the you know trial was going to take place or anything like that, they would most likely be required to cancel those plans. It would take some really significant Thursday evening plans. You know, it can't just be like a dinner party or something. You really would have to have something insanely significant in order to, you know, outweigh the need to testify. Um, so... Um, another, uh, flaw in the case was that, um, there was a variety of missing student witnesses as well that would have been relevant witnesses according to what WSU's theory of the case was. Um, such students would include Adam War, Caitlin McKay, now known as, now known as Caitlin Giberson, Brandon Ritchie, and Eric Herjanto. Um, so there's 10 separate professors, all missing witnesses, Cheryl Oliver, missing witness, and uh, numerous uh, WSU MBA students. Um, and obviously, you know, Thursday evening, Friday, I mean, I'm sorry, Thursday evening, uh, 5.30 uh, p.m. trial on April 8th, they were obviously probably just sitting <laughs> somewhere in Pullman. Um, they were obviously, WSU was keeping these witnesses out of the trial because it was just a frame and, uh, the missing, the missing witness inference should be drawn for every single one of those people. Um, another flaw in the case is another indication of a frame, AKA a flaw in the case. Um, at least in this, uh, situation, every flaw in the case is an indication of a frame, as you can tell by everything that I've, I've shown you and told you here, told you about here. Um, Another flaw was that WSU did not ask the majority of my cross-examination questions. WSU also reworded the questions that they did ask in order to cover matters up. And WSU destroyed my cross-examination records without my knowledge or consent after the trial was over. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's obviously indicative of a frame. Um, and uh, WSU also made me leave the room when Ashley Fagerly testified. Even though WSU could have easily just had a WSU police officer attend the trial for the time that Ashley Fagerly was going to testify against me, WSU has their own police force. They could have used a WSU police officer, and that would have allowed the defendant to be there while Ashley Fagerly testified. And when they brought me to that other room, um, they said that there was a phone that that I would be able to hear her testimony through the phone uh, while being in that other room. And the phone didn't work. It didn't start working until the cross-examination started. So I didn't hear any of uh, the testimony. 
Uh, yeah, I didn't hear any of the testimony. I only heard the cross examination. Um, and I'll I'll explain uh, a little later in this video as to uh, why they they did that. Um, I mean, uh, also uh, aside um, uh, aside from just you know making sure the defendant doesn't hear the testimony, because my um, uh, uh, statements would come later because they had the witnesses testify against me before. I got the chance to speak, um, but um, before I got the chance to make my statements, that is, and testify myself, that is, um, so they didn't want me to be able to hear what she said before I had my chance to go, but um, also, I never heard them swear her in, and I also never heard heard them swear uh, Evan Heary in either, so, so we'll get into that uh, later. Another flaw in the case... Um, was that WSU invented a non-existent person. <laughs> WSU made up a human being. They made up a non-existent person called Dr. Yoshi. There's no Dr. Yoshi involved in the case. Um, there was a um, K.D. Joshi, the professor of the MIS 580 class, and there was a Yoshio Smith, who was an administrative employee for the MBA program. Who did like you know scholarships, internships, and arranged events, stuff like that. Um, so he was a male, and KD Joshi was a female. And what they were doing by making up this false identity of Dr. Yoshi was conflating their identities. They were conflating the identities of those two individuals. Um, and what WC was doing when they did that um, was uh, pretending that they never even spoke to the professor. They were trying to pretend that they never even spoke to the professor. Um, you can see the Dr. Yoshi fake name in the final decision letter and also in the appeals letter, the appeal decision letter. And um, they were trying to come up with a lie. They were trying to pretend they never even spoke to the MIS 580 professor, KD Joshi. And they were doing that because obviously these, these students had turned in false statements about what was said there and they didn't want to get um, the professor involved because it was a very dirty frame and um, there was an audio recording of the lecture. They didn't want to get her to lie. They wanted these students to lie. They didn't want to get her statement, which if she had... Um, corroborated the the student's story then it would obviously look way worse um, when the um, uh, lecture recording could be contrasted with that um, but also um, if she had said something different then that would be bad for their investigation also because they were trying to frame me and trespass me based on what was said in that class but they were lying and you know what could the professor possibly say they knew they didn't have um, a very good out on that. So they were pretending that they never even spoke to the professor, which is impossible because if you're going to issue a trespass based on what somebody said to a professor, you would think that you would talk to the, the professor. And, um, you know, it's just impossible that they would have uh, issued a trespass admonition uh, based on what was said there and not have spoken to the professor of the class. They didn't, they were even, they were trying to pretend that they didn't even look her up. You know, they have electronic faculty manuals where you could just look up who's the teacher of a class. Um, you know, even, even just a basic Google search can figure out who KD Joshi is, who, who was teaching that MS 580 class at WCU. Um, so they were trying to pretend they were coming, they were lying. They were coming up with a lie. They were trying to pretend that they didn't even know who KD Joshi was. They, they couldn't even tell the difference between KD Joshi and Yoshio Smith. So they made up a fake identity, a fake person to try and pretend that they had never even spoke to the professor. <laughs> so quite indicative of a frame. Um, also, another flaw was in the case was that WSU put the wrong address on the trespass admonition. Uh, you'll see it says 99164. The real address was 99163. And um, they also didn't uh, sign the trespass when they served it or before they served it or anything like that. Um, 
and the unsigned version of trespass still to this day is in the student conic file um for me so they they obviously did that on purpose they didn't sign it they didn't have they didn't fill it out properly and it had the wrong address on it when they served it and these were things that they were obviously doing to try and weasel out of being held accountable later i eventually did i i have seen a backdated version of the signed trespass i saw a um a few months after the trespass was actually served um, I did end up getting a copy of a, a signed version of it, but it was backdated. They signed it after, and it said Kelly Stewart, and it had the date of the, it was backdated to the date of the issuing of the trespass, and um, it still wasn't, like, filled out, and it still had the wrong address on it, but the unsigned version is still in the student conic file to this day, which was obviously just a dirty tactic of WSU to try and, you know, wiggle out of being held accountable later. Um, another flaw in the case was that, uh, the final warning letter was ostensibly, ostensibly created on March 10th, but it wasn't actually sent to me until the 19th. And, um, what I think WSU was doing there was trying to push the matter past the deadline to withdraw from classes because they wanted to make sure that I was locked in to getting their undeserved bad grades, you know, and obviously that is so insanely unethical um, to see a university, uh, in my opinion, push a matter past a deadline to withdraw from classes before they do whatever they're trying to do to that student. You know, if you can prove even that alone, which I, I can, I, it's in the student conduct file. You can see it from your, for yourself. And even just seeing that, uh, <laughs> that obviously is indicative of a frame, and, um, you know, they were obviously giving me undeserved bad grades on purpose. They were up to something like that. You know, you would never want to trust a university that would be doing anything that dirty. Um, and they were, you can, you can see it for yourself. You can see when it was sent, you can see the, the date that it was, uh, ostensibly created on. And, um, you know, that's really what, what happened. And, um, another flaw in the case was that, uh, the main pawns of the case were most likely Irish. Um, Lisa McIntyre was the judge. Evan Heary and Ashley Fagerly were the uh, witnesses. And then there was, you know, Caitlin McKay, who had that, that one email about the MIS 580 event. So what WC was doing was using minorities as pawns to frame a Jew. Um, these people were most likely Irish that they were using as pawns, um, which is obviously indicative of, you know, the racial targeting and it's indicative of a frame because they were trying to use them as like the, the fall, the fall guys and the fall gals, uh, the fall people or the fall guy and the fall gals that is. Um, and another flaw in the case was that, um, WCU altered the purpose of the trial after the trial was already over, um, which is totally illegal. If you look at the charging documents for the case, and if you look at the trial transcript, you can see at both the beginning of the trial and the end of the trial, and you can see in the charging documents, that WCU was stating that the purpose for the failure to comply charge was because I didn't obey the rules of the letter, the, the final warning letter. That's, at least that's what they claimed. And um, then they realized that their case was stupid. After the trial was already over, they realized their case was stupid and it wasn't going to work because I was quite adamant at the trial, as you can see in the trial transcript, that it the whole thing was a lie because they weren't presenting the video evidence of it. They didn't bring forward the professor to testify. I was testifying on, I was testifying under oath, um, at that trial that it, it was not, it didn't happen the way they said it happened. And, um, all they had was Cheryl Oliver's notes, a person who wasn't there. And it was an unsworn statement. And she was just saying what she heard from someone else who also wasn't testifying. And then they had, you know, David Sprott saying what he heard someone else say, and he wasn't there. He wasn't there. He was, he was, he was talking about what someone else said <laughs> and, you know, who 
the other person was there that he was talking about, and they were keeping that witness out of the trial, they realized that it just wasn't going to work. Nothing was going to trump my testimony because I, I came to the trial, I testified under, under oath that the finance exam event did not happen the way they were saying it happened. It just didn't. And um, they, they didn't have anything to trump what I was saying, so they had to illegally alter the purpose of the case after the trial was already over. If you look at the decision letter, the final decision letter, you can see in there that it then stated that the failure to comply charge was based on not stopping speaking as the professor was interrupting me. So they illegally altered the purpose of the case after the trial was already over because they realized that it wasn't going to work, which there's no way that's legal. And then what's even funnier is that they realized on appeal that their case was really stupid again they realized that the interruption part wasn't going to work either because um i'll read you the actual uh wac for failure to comply um so wac 504-26-207 failure to comply with university officials or law enforcement officers Failure to comply with lawful directions of university officials and slash or law enforcement officers acting in performance of their duties and slash or failure to identify oneself to these persons when requested to do so. Now, the problem for WSU was that the professor never said stop. The professor never said quiet. The professor never said cease. The professor never said David, please. The professor never said anything tantamount to that at all. All she was doing was like interrupting me and, and saying her own thing. And she was obviously just doing it to harass me, just to embarrass me and insult me. But she never gave me a direction. So I didn't fail to comply with, with what she was saying. And WSU realized that even their new version of the case was really stupid. So they illegally altered the purpose of the case after the trial was already over a second time. And then they said in the um, appeal document... Um, that the failure to comply charge was um, then based on uh, um, you know uh, other things. So they stated, I'll read it to you here. It says, for the purpose of clarifying our decision, we note that the basis for finding you responsible for violating WAC 504-26-207 in the initial order is not limited to your classroom interaction with Dr. Yoshi on 4-1-2010. Now, first of all, that's not clarifying. That's redefining. Um, Second of all, they used the fake identity, Dr. Yoshi, again, in order to pretend that they didn't even know who the professor was, um, to try and cover up why they weren't, um, you know, speaking to the professor um, for their side of the story, the professor's side of the story. Um, and also, they they weren't saying what uh, this, this uh, violation was based on. When a court or a you know, an appeal committee or, you know, court of appeals or any kind of judge or anything like that issues an order. One of the main purposes is to have transparency so we can see what their decision is based on. Why are they saying this person's guilty? Why are they saying they did what they did? Why is the court saying they did what they did? And the appeals committee never even states what this new version of the conviction is based on. They just leave it completely open-ended, which was obviously, and it's, that's obviously indicative of a frame because they're just intentionally leaving it open-ended and not explaining it because they know they don't have a good case. That's obviously what they did there. And um, as I stated, also, they're not allowed to illegally redefine the case. They're not allowed to redefine the case after the trial is already over. That is illegal. Um, you know, you, you can just compare the final decision letter and compare that appeals uh, decision letter with the charging documents. And also you can even see in the trial at both the beginning and the end, WSU was saying what it was based on. And I'm about at 30 minutes, so I'll see you in the next video. Hi, welcome back. Um, so yeah, it, WSU was illegally altering the purpose of the case after the trial was already over, and they did that twice. Um, so, um, 
I mean, they technically probably did it in, in much more than uh, two ways, but they did it in two extremely significant ways it, with the uh, failure to comply um, issue. And another uh, flaw in the case was that um, Roger Sandberg refused to attend the trial, even though I paid for his representation. Um, and uh, he gave me bad advice um, and he wrote the appeal so that I would lose. Uh, if you look at the appeal that he wrote, you can tell that he threw the case. What he was doing was um, he was admitting in my name to the truth of those email allegations. He was saying that those things that were stated in those emails and the other unsworn statements were factual. He was admitting to the truth of them in my name when those things were not true. Um, so if you look through that uh, appeal that he wrote, he's consistently calling the information factual. He wasn't simply saying that it was a fact that the email was sent or a fact that the unsworn statement was turned in or that it was a fact that someone stated those things. He was saying that it was facts, that the, the information was factual. He was stating that the substance was factual. And um, he was repeatedly, through the appeal, constantly uh, calling these things facts. Again, the, the substance, he, he was calling the information factual. Um, so do you see like uh, how, they, how they get you on the conspiracy? Uh, what they do is they, they ask students to turn in a bunch of false statements and they say, oh, just keep it in email. Don't use the web form. You'll get in trouble for lying there. So just write in a bunch of fake stuff and then uh, just send it all in email and we can protect you. You won't get in trouble. And then they string together a bunch of emails and other unsworn statements uh, to convict you. And then you have a corrupt Pullman lawyer who admits to the truth of that information in the appeal. Boom. There it is. Um, so, um, obviously indicative of a frame. And um, you can also see in there that uh, Roger Sandberg was using like false uh, arguments, like legal arguments. Like he was saying um, that WSU giving me that final warning letter or David Sprott sending me the final warning letter um, for WSU to have a trial um, and then bring that stuff up again was double jeopardy. And he cited this WAC that um, was referring to possible punishments that a student conduct board or a student conduct officer after like an official hearing can provide you. And, and so instead of like a suspension or an expulsion, they can also provide you a warning um, as your official punishment. That's what that WAC was talking about. But that's not what David Sprott did. David Sprott just, uh, he just wrote a letter to me and it was just called a final, he just called it a final warning letter. So what WC was doing and Roger Sandberg, the corrupt Pullman attorney was, um, they were kind of pulling the wool over my eyes. You see that they were, uh, it, it's an argument that, um, a student who's, you know, going, th who's going through that, uh, conspiracy, um, the target of the conspiracy may not notice. Cause I, I wasn't a law student. Uh, you know, I wasn't a pre-law student. I wasn't a law student. None of my parents are lawyers, um, you know, and so it seems like, oh, final warning, there's a WAC talking about a warning, maybe that's a decent argument. But then, you know, after the conspiracy is over, you realize, whoa, they were tricking me. It was a scam. Uh, you know, that final warning letter is not the same thing as what that WAC is talking about. So it's all a, a methodized conspiracy. It's a method. I'm sorry. It's a methodical conspiracy. All their tactics are methodized. Everything they're doing is obviously uh, a, a conspiracy they've done many times. And that's aside from noticing the audio recording where Katie Joshi is harassing me over the fact that she's done it many times. And I also have uh, audio recordings of Kenneth Butterfield harassing me over uh, the fact that the conspiracy has been done before. But um, you can also just look at the conspiracy itself and tell that it was clearly methodical. Um, which is indicative of my innocence, right? <laughs> you know, I'm here to exonerate myself and you can tell that I'm innocent because these things happened. Um, and, uh, 
he also, Roger Sandberg also filed the petition for review late um, to get the matter thrown out of court so it wouldn't enter into the justice system because, um, number one, it would, you know, if a court had looked at the case, they would have overturned the conviction. But more importantly, if you think about it, is the fact that um, WSU also doesn't want all their tactics to get exposed. They don't want that information. They don't want the case being visible to others through legal research. Um, so they were stopping um, the courts from finding out about the situation so that because if it goes into courts, then others can do legal research and they would have seen all those tactics that I'm showing to you now. They would have seen what WSU was doing. Now WSU can no longer have their you know racist operation of you know ruining the lives of Jews and others. Um, So anyway, um, so you're probably wondering, how was WSU discriminating? Like in what way was um, WSU discriminating? So they were racially discriminating. Um, and uh, one of the ways that they were doing it was by discriminating in who got into the one year MBA program versus who got into the two year uh, the one-year MBA program was the accelerated program, so you could do the same degree in one year. And in order to do it, you had to have a business undergraduate degree. And um, WSU was discriminating on the basis of race and who they let in there. Um, the way WSU was discriminating was um, giving uh, unfair advantage or you know discriminating in favor of German, English, or Japanese people, and anybody else was got the you know the bad side of the deal, and I was the Jew, so I got it the worst. Now, as you can tell, um, they were discriminating based on neo-Nazi principles, um, which uh, you can tell, and <laughs> also uh, why they've um, you know been so uh, passionate about covering this up. Because uh, as you can tell, this is a pretty um, uh, severe situation. And I never signed um, their settlement. They offered me a $0 settle settlement and they tried to trick me into signing it. They had the corrupt Pullman lawyer try to like convince me into signing it. So, um, you know, there's people like me. You can see about the Robert Barber case, which was probably a similar case. They probably framed him too. Um, but... There's probably a lot more of us. The, the difference between Robert Barber and a lot of students is that he was famous. So the media had to cover his story. The media refuses to cover my story because they don't want the people of Washington State finding out about this. Um, even though I've contacted every single major news organization, TV and print in the state, and they've refused to cover this. And I did that years ago, um, well within you know the first year that it happened. Um, and, uh, anyways, um, so they, tr they tried to get me to sign a settlement so that, and in the settlement, it, it basically stated that I wouldn't be able to hold any of those people accountable for what they did. Uh, but it was zero dollars. They were just saying they would take the matter off my record. And some of you, uh, those who follow me on social media, you've seen that settlement. I, I still have the PDF of it and I shared it on my social media account. So you've seen it, many of you. Um, so the, and the, so that's factor too. A lot of students probably got tricked into signing those settlements and that's a wrap, you know, that's a wrap. So what could they do later on down the road in life? I never signed it. And uh, so that's why I'm able to be vocal about this. But anyway, so WSU was discriminating, um, racially discriminating, German, English, Japanese. Um, those were the races they were giving uh, favor to. And um, for the purpose of this conversation, let's call that, let's call those people Aryan. German, English, or Japanese people will call Aryan and anything else non-Aryan. I understand that the word Aryan has been used differently throughout history, but for the purpose of this conversation, let's just call it that for the, for the ease of the conversation. Now, um, in the one-year MBA program, um, WSU took every single 
Aryan MBA student that had um, a business undergraduate degree, and the two-year MBA program is where you go if you don't have a business undergraduate degree. You can only get into the one year if you have a business undergraduate degree. But WSU took every single um, Aryan MBA student who had a business undergraduate degree and put them in the one-year program. And um, like I said, the two-year program is where you know you're supposed to go if you don't have is where you would go if you don't have uh, a um, an undergraduate business degree. But they also put um, certain students in the two-year program who do have, who do have a business undergraduate degree. The way it's supposed to work is if they don't have a good enough GMAT score, or undergraduate GPA, or a good enough looking resume, um, they're supposed to be whoever you know the most qualified get into the one-year program. And um, anyone left over who can't get into one of the seats for the you know, one-year program gets put in the two-year. So there was at least 15 people in the two-year program who had business undergraduate degrees. And not a single one of them was Aryan. Not one. WSU put every single Aryan uh, student that had a business undergraduate degree into the one-year program. Now, you're probably noticing that... Kate Esselbach was in the two-year program, but the reasoning for that was that she majored in communication, not business. Um, you're probably also no noticing that Mike Dodd was in the two-year program, but he majored in psychology, not business. Um, and you're probably also noticing that Caitlin McKay was um, in the one-year program, but she's probably Irish. Now, you're probably wondering why. Um, you're probably thinking, oh, is that a counter-argument um, to be used against me? Uh, no, it is not. And I'll tell you why. Because, like I said, WSU put all of the Aryan students who had business undergraduate degrees into the one-year program. Now, how many German, English, Japanese people do you think there are in the world? How many of them would be, you know, would be there? <laughs> you know, how, how many of them would have applied to the WSU MBA program? There's more non-Aryan people in the United States than there are Aryan people. Again, according to our definition of Aryan, German, English, or Japanese. So even if you put all of the um, Aryan students with business undergraduate degrees into the one-year program, which WSU did do, um, you would still have empty seats to fill. So they had to put in some non-Aryan people in that one-year program, because otherwise they would have blown their cover. Um, so you would have to fill those other seats because that's just a matter of statistics and reality. There's only so many German, English, or Japanese people in the United States or even in the world. Um, so, you know, the Caitlin McKay issue is not a counter argument at all. That fits perfectly with my theory. There's nothing at all that refutes anything I'm saying in there. Um, um now, WSU was also discriminating by giving um, undeserved good grades to Aryan students and undeserved bad grades to non-Aryan students. I was the Jew, the one and only Jew in the program, so I got it the worst. I was put on academic probation at the end of fall 2009, and um, then also they, they just failed me out in, in spring 2010 because I didn't complete their classwork from home that they tried to force me to do. And then they just failed me in all those classes and, um, of course, failed me out. But as I'm sure you would agree, they were probably just going to give me bad grades anyway, double academic probation me, no matter what I turned in, and just failed me out entirely anyway, um, you know, for the spring 2010 semester. Um, they were obviously going to do that. Um, but uh, anyways, so... The Aryan students got better grades, and the non-Aryan students got worse grades. It's just a fact. It's what happened in the MBA program while I was there. Um, so, I mean, you know, you, you're just never going to be able to beat that trend. You just see, you just see way too much, um, you know, happening in favor of German, English, Japanese students. And, you know, the way the program was divided. And I'm, again, I'm only speaking about what happened while I was there. Okay, I can't speak to what happened in the past. I can only tell you about what was there amongst the people who started in fall 2009 at the same time I did. 
And of those people, there was at least 15 people in the business. Uh, um, I mean, I'm sorry, in the MBA program, in the two-year program, there was at least 15 people who had business undergraduate degrees, and they were all non-Aryan. So, um, you know, you're just never going to explain away these trends. And there was better grades given to the Aryan students as well, and worse grades given to the non-Aryan students. And that's, of course, on top of the fact that I have professors on recording harassing me over giving me undeserved bad grades. And I even have uh, Kenneth Butterfield on recording harassing me over the fact that he was giving me undeserved bad grades and giving Kate Esselbach undeserved good grades. Um, so that's pretty good evidence too. And I'd like to see, <laughs> I'd like to see you try and refute anything I'm saying. Um, WSU is also providing, uh, tuition, more tuition waiving jobs to Aryan students than they were to non-Aryan students. Um, so these tuition waiving jobs were called assistantships. Um, and there's two kinds of those. There's a teaching assistantship and a graduate assistantship. The teaching assistantships are just what you think they are. They're, you know, like helping professors grade tests and stuff like that. Those are only 10 hours a week um, of work. Uh, they last for, um, you know, the entire year. And uh, the um, and they can, they can also, you can find one like mid-year though. I mean, you could find one at the semester point as well. But um, they usually, you know, go by contracts for the whole year. And um, there's also graduate assistantships. Um, the graduate assistantships are 20 hours a week. And um, they, um, so both of, these, both of these kinds of assistantships waive a portion of your tuition, but the graduate assistantship weighs much more because it's 20 hours a week. And the graduate assistantships are like office jobs. Um, and I had one of those, I had one of those, um, now you're probably thinking, well, how did the Jewish guy have a, have a graduate assistantship? Well, I'll tell you, um, in both my case and in Evan Heary's case, the college of business didn't offer us any assistantship when we started. Um, they, they let us into the program. They put Evan Heary and I mean me, they put Evan Heary and me into the two year program. He had a business undergraduate degree. I didn't. I majored in journalism, so of course I'd be there. But um, he was there because he was uh, non-Aryan. And um, the College of Business didn't offer us assistantships. We found our own assistantships. We called, um, not together. I mean, we, I just happened to know that he did this also. But I, I was calling all the departments in the school looking for an assistantship during the orientation program that I was you know, the orientation program of uh, the graduate school um, before the graduate school started, technically. So the MBA orientation program was at the beginning of August. It was the first three weeks of August. And then the last week of August was the first week of classes, the fall 2009 semester. So during that uh, orientation, I was just calling um, all the different departments to search for an open assistantship. And I eventually found one in the French administration building working under Lori Wiest. And Evan Heary had found his... Um, he had told me, he found it uh, a little bit before the orientation started. Um, and, uh, he said that he found it in the cub, in the cub, the Compton union building, which of course turned out to be true. Even he admits that his assistantship was in the cub. Um, but we found our own. Um, so, you know, again, um, that does not, you know, that's not a counter argument <laughs> against me. And of course I was fired from my graduate assistantship, um, at the end of fall 2009. And it was supposed to be a contract job that lasted for the whole year. And, um, the only way they, they could fire you other than, you know, I guess, I guess if you did something really wrong at work, they could fire you. But the only, um, other way they could fire you is if you get under a 3.0 GPA, which is exactly why WSU gave me the 2.92 GPA um, for fall 2009, so they could illegally fire me from that tuition waiving job. They took my assistant, uh, my assistantship away, and they gave it to Mike Dodd, a German student. So they took away a Jew's job and gave it to a German. Um, and WSU was also treating um, the Aryan students better. They just got better treatment. They were put on a pedestal and they were just treated very well and professors were just very nice to them and gave them everything. And uh, the way they treated the non-Aryan students was like garbage. 
you treated us like garbage. And um, you could definitely notice a, um, a disparity in the treatment. Um, and also another clue is that, you know, I was the one and only Jew in the program and I was the one and only person who was framed for disciplinary matters. And I was also harassed the most. So that's a pretty good clue also <laughs> that WC was racist. Um, and so anyways, um, now one thing you may be wondering about is um, why there were minorities that were professors for WSU. You're probably thinking, well, uh, you know, Babu Mary Doss, Sung K An, Bernard Wong on Wings, Susan He, Katie Joshi, and there are other minority, uh, there are other non-Aryan professors, um, minorities working as professors um, at WSU. So does that counter anything that David is saying? No, it does not. And I will tell you why. Because, um, first of all, if you look at the hierarchy of WSU, what do you see? You, yeah, you see some, some uh, non-Aryan uh, people working there, but where are they? They're down here. And who do you see? They're not up there. Who do you see up here making the big salaries? The deans, the associate deans, the other extremely high-ranked employees. Who's up there? They're predominantly white. Okay? Which obviously um, also serves as a strategy for WSU to create a facade. So all these students going to college there, they don't know any better. They, they think, oh... Um, WCU must be fine. This, this, is, this school isn't racist. I see, you know, an African-American professor. I see an Indian professor. I see this. I see that. But how much do you think a professor makes versus how much do you think a dean makes? Okay. You know, David Sprott's not even the main dean of the business school. He's not even the main one. And he makes a quarter million dollars a year. Um, so noticing minority professors doesn't refute what I'm saying, because you just got to look at the hierarchy. Just look at the deans and the associate deans at WSU. They're predominantly white. And as with the case with the other extremely high-ranking jobs, too, where they're cranking, you know, two, three, sometimes more, um, two or three times more, and sometimes even more than that, than those professors are making. Okay. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's good. That's horrible. That's the worst thing in the world. And I think that whole school should be shut down. And I think any uh, hierarchy that does that um, needs to change. And that is that is just, you know, a horrible problem um, for any any part of society that would be doing that, you know. But I'm just trying to prove my case here. That's all. So if I sound passionate, it's just because I'm trying to to stop this stuff. I'm trying to prove my case and explain to you that this story, that this stuff is going on. Anyways, um, also another factor is that, um, yeah, you do see, you know, minority professors or not non-Aryan professors, but there is such a thing as the uncle Tom phenomenon. Um, you know, uh, people being race betrayers, that's gone on all throughout history. That's not a new thing. As long as racism exists, has existed, there's always been, you know, a certain portion of people willing to sell out uh, just to get jobs. And in my opinion, I think that those professors were, I mean, it, it's past an opinion. Those professors were certainly examples of that. But in my opinion, here's what I want to tell you. Um, in my opinion, those professors had really low self-confidence. In my opinion, and I'm not saying this to get back at them, um, I, I'm just telling you the truth and look me in the eyes when I'm telling you this. Um, in my opinion, those, those professors had low self-confidence, kind of low self-worth. And I think that they were just desperate for a job and maybe they just felt so desperate that they were willing to transgress you know they were so desperate to get their foot in the door at a major state university which can be hard to do there's a lot of academics who you know never really get their foot in the door at a major university and maybe those minority professors were just so desperate that they were willing to transgress um you know cult-like organizations tend to seek out people with low self-confidence because they know they can mold them to do their bidding so um 
you know, again, yes, you do see some non-Aryan professors, but if you look at the hierarchy at WCU, it is clearly racist. And um, the idea of a race betrayer or the kind of the Uncle Tom phenomenon is um, nothing new that's existed for as long as racism has existed. So that's my answer to that. Um, so anyways, now you're probably noticing that there's some flaws with the student conduct file and I'm going to walk you through what the uh, flaws are. You'll notice that there's no signature on the decision letter, the final uh, decision letter. And it also has the word copy written on top of it. WCU has never provided me a signed version of that letter and they've never provided me a version that doesn't say copy. Every time they've ever given me the student conic file, um, or even, you know, that letter, it's always looked the way that it looks in the student conic file provided to you. And they obviously did that on purpose. You know, why would they ever have a non-signed version of it? Why would they ever have provided that? And, um, there was actually even one point, uh, where, um, WSU filed that, <laughs> Uh, unsigned version as an exhibit in a court case. Um, Edwin Hamada had, a, you know, um, uh, submitted an, an exhibit where it was, it looked like that. They were even submitting it to court as a, as a, as a copy or an unsigned copy. But WCU was obviously doing that as a legal strategy. Um, and like I said, in every version of the student content file they've ever given me, and, you know, they've never given me, um, in every version of the student conduct file they've given me, it's always been that unsigned version with the word copy on it. And they've never given me um, that decision letter with the signature on it. Um, and also they've never given me um, that decision letter without the word copy on it. It's always looked like that. Um, and uh, they clearly did that on purpose. It's always looked like what you see in the student conduct file. And they clearly did that on purpose. They obviously also didn't sign the trespass. And they did that on purpose too. Um, like I said, I did see a backdated version at one point, but they never signed it when they served it to me or before they served it. Um, so they gave me an unsigned version when they served it. And then the unsigned version is still in the student conic file to this day. And these tactics were obviously done by WSU on purpose. Um, they were um, clearly... Um, you know, doing these dirty tactics to try and wiggle themselves out of being held accountable uh, later. Now, you're probably noticing, and this is just the, you know, the beginning of, of the flaws in the case, or, or I'm sorry, the flaws in the student conic file, I'm going to get into more, but you're probably noticing that tactics like that wouldn't, wouldn't get WSU, you know, off the hook. Uh, it wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't let WSU weasel out of being held accountable. In fact, it may even exacerbate the situation. They may get him in even more trouble for not only doing the frame and these other illegal uh, acts, but um, they may also, you know, have to pay even like more in punitive damages if they were to have been sued. Uh, they, they wouldn't have gotten them off the hook. It, it might have even been worse. They, they might have even had to have paid even more in damages for even trying those dirty tactics. And you would be right. You, you would certainly be right if WSU would have ever been held accountable by a fair court. You know, it wouldn't work that way with a puppet judge, a Whitman County judge. And it wouldn't work that way with a, a judge of a federal court who would just be doing favors for WSU. I know that in my case, when I filed my federal lawsuit, the judge for my case was just doing favors for WSU. He was corrupt. And um, so these flaws in the student conic file, as I described them to you, um, know that, yeah, that it wouldn't work for a fair court, but a fake court with a puppet judge just doing favors for WSU, that's what they were preparing for. So I'm about at 30 minutes, so I'll see you in the next video. Hi, welcome back. Um, so before continuing with the, uh, uh, flaws in the student conic file, I wanted to speak further about, um, something I spoke about in the previous, uh, 30 minute video, the one that's right before this in the overall three hour video. Now, um, 
I told you how uh, WCU provided more tuition-waiving jobs to Aryan students than they did to non-Aryan students, and that's absolutely true. And um, I told you about how me and Evan Heary found our own assistantships, and that College of Business didn't offer us any when we started the program. Um, and that's absolutely true. But I hope that I'm not misunderstood in that I don't want you to think that even after the initial offerings um, made by the College of Business at WSU, that there was some sort of, um, you know, fix to the problem. It's not like, and then students were able to find their own assistantships, and then the trend of discrimination was gone. No, that is not the case at all. Um, if you look at any point in time that I was in the WCU MBA program, which was eight months, so um, August 2009, um, and the, the whole month of August 2009, and um, all the way through March 2010, so those full eight months, um, if you look at any point in time, any day in that um in, in those uh, eight months, you would notice that the Aryan students had more assistantships than the non-Aryan students, okay? So even after you factor in the students who found the uh, assistantships on their own, there was still more assistantships for the Aryan students than the non-Aryan students. So I wanna make sure that's clear. So um, I just want you to understand that um, at any point within the time that I was in the WSU MBA program, Aryan students had more assistantships than non-Aryan students, okay? So WSU as an institution simply gave more assistantships to the Aryan students than the non-Aryan students, okay? Now, um, uh, back on the topic of flaws in the student conduct file. Now, Another flaw in the student conic file was that the file had washed out text in certain places. Now, that was WSU's doing, not mine, okay? WSU washed out that text, not me. Um, and you can tell that they did it <laughs> and not me because um, the washed out text occurs in places where they had massive holes in their story. So you can tell that it was a strategy by WSU. And um, they also included in the student conic file a fax memorandum. Now, what they did was WSU washed out the text in the student conic file, and then they faxed the student conic file to me. And that was the first way that they provided me the student conic file. And um, they obviously tried to make the washed out text look like it was the result of a fax machine output. But you can tell it was just a strategy done by WSU because the washed out text occurs in places where it was covering you know, flaws with their case. Um, and also because a fax machine's output doesn't look that bad, even in 2010. Um, and I had that um, student conic file as it was at that time, April 2nd, 2010. I had that faxed to me because um, I didn't have a fax machine. I had it faxed to me at a local print and copy center. So, you know, even a fax machine in 2010, um, especially one at a print and copy center, would not look as bad as uh, that washed out text looks. The output from a fax machine um, would not look as bad as that text looks. So it was obviously done by WCU and then they made sure to fax it um, first. That was the first way that they gave it to me. And um, also they never should have uh, faxed it. They could have just had a WCU police officer serve it to me. Uh, my home. I mean, it's Pullman. It's a small college town. They could easily have a WCU police officer simply pick up the student conduct file from the Office of Student Conduct and just drive it over to my house in Pullman. It wouldn't have taken more than 20 minutes out of their shift 
um, to just get that file and serve it to me at my home. And that's what they should have done, but they didn't want to do that because they wanted to wash out a lot of the text. You see? Um, they also could have just had me um, pick up the student conduct file at the Office of Student Conduct. They could have just allowed me to go there to pick it up, and I could have had a police escort or not had a police escort because they said that, you know, because of the trespass, I would need a police escort. So if even if they would have required a police escort, that still would have been more proper than a uh, fax of the student conic file. That's, that's totally inappropriate to fax a file that's that important. They obviously did that as a strategy to be able to wash out the text. Um, and uh, another thing is to note is that um, I've had the student conic file sent to me by mail several times over the years. Um, several times in 2010 and in 2011 and I've also had uh, WSU email me the student conic file. They emailed it to me in 2016. And the only time it's ever been faxed to me was that first time on April 2nd, 2010. And in all of the other versions of the student conic file that they've provided to me, which was by mail and once by email, um, it still had the washed out text in the student conic file, and it still had the fax memorandum in there too. That fax, fax memorandum is um, like an official part of the student conic file. It's been a part of the student conic file this entire time. I've never gotten uh, a version of the student conic file that didn't have the fax memorandum in there and didn't have the washed out text in there and didn't have the other flaws that I'm describing to you with the student conic file. So that was obviously a strategy done by WSU so that when the student that they framed um, comes forward to exonerate themselves, it looks like all they have is the result of a fax machine output. But you can tell that that's a strategy by WSU because obviously, like I said, the, the washout text occurs over flaws in their um, case and there was no reason to fax it in the first place. That is totally impro improper, that was totally inappropriate, and they obviously did that on purpose as a strategy. Um, there's no other explanation. So it's obviously just something that WSU did, and I'm telling you under penalty of perjury that they have provided me the student conic file by mail and email also, and even in those other versions of the student conic file, uh, that were given to me after the original faxing of it, it still contains the fax memorandum and the washed out text and the other flaws in the student conic file. Um, now, um, an example of like where they were washing out the text was in the, um, like the Cheryl Oliver undated narrative. And that was obviously a very precarious part of their case. And you can see that was washed out. Um, you know, you can see one of the emails that um, Cheryl Oliver had sent, um, the one that was ostensibly sent on Wednesday, 20, September 23rd, 2009 at 5.51 p.m. Uh, that was a very uh, ridiculous email um, one of the funniest, uh, lines in, in that email was, um, I have consulted with counseling services as this is not the first data point indicating that this student may need some assistance. And, um, I mentioned this in the annotated student conic file that it was so funny that they were trying to act like they were collecting data. I wrote, um, in the student, in the annotated student conic file, I wrote, why are they collecting data from mere email allegations? What kind of science would be based on email allegations? That data would be, and of course was, wholly unreliable. Then I wrote, look at how serious and faux professional they tried to make this appear. This email and the emails from the other WSU employees were scripted contrivances that were written to cover up the harassment and prepare for the frame. So, uh, you can see um, not just uh, that example in the um, 
undated narrative, but you can see many other examples of washed out text. Another one, um, another example of the washed out text was uh, involving the Ashley Faggerly situation. And I spoke about that um, also in the, uh, the, the video that's approximately 30 minutes, the one about the Facebook messages. They were clearly um, washing out text um, on purpose because they're covering up these these huge problems with their case. Um, I mean, it's just insanely obvious that it was just a strategy done by them. And as I said, there was no reason to fax it in the first place, and you know all the other uh, uh, indications of a frame in what they were doing there. Now, another um, flaw with the student conic file, which is kind of similar to the uh, washed out text issue with the fax memorandum, is the uh, two-hole punch and the clerical note about the two-hole punch. Um, WSU did the, those two-hole punches, not me. And you can tell that they did it because there's a clerical note in there about it. And just like the fax memorandum, um, the clerical note has been a part of... Um, the student conic file in every single time that they've provided me the student conic file. And the two hole punch uh, through some of the documents that are in the student conic file, uh, the same goes for, for the, for those uh, documents. The two hole punched versions are the only versions that's ever been in the student conic file. So you could tell that WC did it because what they were doing was putting the two hole punch through a few like important words in the file. And um, it was obviously just a strategy done by WCU. Um, an example of the two hole punch through the words was in one of the Evan Heary emails. If you look at the Evan Heary email that was ostensibly sent on Tuesday, March 30th, 2010 fi at 5.34 p.m., um, there's a, a pretty bold claim that he makes, and then there's a two-hole punch through some of the words uh, that he, he wrote. And um, now, if you look at the page that has the, the two-hole punch um, through some of those words, look at the margin um, on that page. Now, as you know, you can't get... Um, a page to have a small margin at the top of the page unless a person actually decreases that margin to put the words at the top of the page. So you can tell that WSU did that on purpose because why would the margin be so far up on the page unless they put, someone had to put it up there. They had to put it up there and then um, also the two hole punch goes straight through some words and how would they not notice that themselves? Um, the margin's too small. Um, even if you take into account the fact that uh, the pages were scanned, um, the margin is just way too high to be normal. It just doesn't make sense. And why would there be a two-hole punch through the top when three-hole punches through the side work so much better? You know, it, this was obviously a strategy by WSU. And I'm going to read to you um, the line that the two-hole punch goes through. Um so here's what Evan Heary said, and it's, it's so convenient that the two-hole punch goes through this. Uh, so Evan Heary, talking about me, he says, he wrote in the email, I mean, I believe the chances of him pulling a weapon out of a backpack are just as likely as pulling out a banana. His eccentric and offensive behaviors make the classroom a unfair environment. So first of all, he said A instead of an. And keep in mind, he got his MBA and I didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, and also, um, so the words as likely a two hole, uh, one of the whole, uh, one of the punches goes through there. And um, the word and uh, between eccentric, eccentric and offensive, one of the uh, holes goes through there. So you really think that, um, you know, that was anything other than intentional by WSU? Because think about how bold of a sentence that is to have a two-hole punch go through it. WSU obviously did that um, on purpose. And the margins are really high. Even if you take into account the fact that the pages were scanned, um, you could tell that the original uh, scan of it still had too high of margins. 
And how would uh, WSU have never noticed that the uh, two-hole punch goes through words? Um, it's just completely um, ridiculous to assume anything other than WSU doing it um, as a strategy. They obviously did that on purpose to try and weasel people out of being held accountable for what they did, which is indicative of a frame. Now, um, for those of you who follow me on social media, you know that in June 2016, I distributed audio recordings of lectures from the WSU MBA program. And those audio recordings were um, completely unedited. The only, uh, the only thing that I did to them was I cut off the beginning of the lecture so that the recording starts right when the lecture starts. So I cut off what was, you know, before, which I'm not sure that I would be legally allowed to share recordings of that stuff because there may not be like an implied consent to be recorded. And then from the moment the uh, lecture ends and then the recordings just show the, the full lecture and they weren't um, edited in any other way. They weren't altered in any other way. Those were exactly as what was recorded on those days. They were authentic. And um, so in June 2016, I shared the, uh, many of those and um, uh, shared them on my uh, social media, uh, Facebook page. Um, and I also shared many documents from the case. Um, and I also told my story in the social media posts. And then I realized that I probably need a, a, a better like exoneration um, approach than just that. So that's where this project came from. And what I did was I asked uh, WSU for another version of my student conic file. I asked them to send me the student conic file, but this time I asked for them to email it to me because I realized a very important um, strategy they were doing, something that, that they were doing. They had only faxed me the student conic file and they had only mailed me the student conic file, but they had never emailed it to me. So the ways they were providing it were ways where there was no like permanent record as to what the file truly was. And WSU told me that they only, they only hold on to those student conic files for seven years. So, um, I asked, uh, I asked uh, the Office of Student Conduct to email me the Student Conduct file in uh, summer 2016. And this was after I had already been sharing um, audio recordings of the harassment that WSU and, other, and students at WSU had done to me where they were admitting that it was just a frame. Um, so I, had, I was exonerating myself on social media and um, when WSU emailed me the student conic file, it had three new pages that weren't in the student conic file before. And um, those three pages were an academic transcript. And what I think WSU is doing is another strategy. I think that they were trying to get me to share uh, the three page academic transcript so that they, that they could then get me in trouble somehow, because maybe that would provide them uh, a legal reason to be able to pull the, um, uh, you know, w the files off the, the internet or to pull at least those um, pages off the internet, or maybe have my Facebook page even shut down or, um, you know, be able to give them a legal reason to, uh, uh, maybe even pull the, the whole thing up the internet because they knew that it was all in one uh, PDF file. Um, they emailed me just one PDF file and it contained the three, uh, ac uh, the three page academic transcript. So I think that they're trying to get me to share that file so that I get in trouble. I think that they would provide them maybe some sort of reason to sue me, maybe some sort of reason to pull it off social media or get my Facebook page shut down, or maybe provide a reason for them not to release my transcripts when I apply for law school. But either way, um, they're obviously up to no good. It's another one of their dirty strategies because that three page academic transcript wasn't in the student conic file before. 
And I've even gotten the student conic file in 2011, and it didn't have that three-page academic transcript. And why would an academic transcript be in a student conic file anyway? That's a totally separate matter. So it's just insane that the academic transcript was in there. It was obviously done by, for, by WSU for some sort of uh, dirty strategy. Um, so I unfortunately had to take those three pages out and just share the rest of the student conic file. But I hope you don't you know, hold that against me because th there's nothing in there that's relevant. It's just a three-page academic transcript and uh, nothing more. And um, also, I'm under penalty of perjury telling you that that's the only thing that I took out of the student conic file. And you can look through the final decision letter and every single thing that they reference is accounted for in the student conic file. And when you look through the student conic file, you see lots of stuff that's like embarrassing to share. And so you know I'm not taking anything out. I'm clearly showing you everything. I'm showing you, you know, um, every single bit of it, even the stuff that's embarrassing. Um, and uh, my academic record is well known. Everyone knows that I got a 3.38 in undergrad. Everyone knows that I got a uh, 2.92 for fall 2009. And everyone knows that I just got five Fs uh, for spring 2010 because I didn't complete their classwork from home and I didn't uh, do their finals the way they were trying to force me to finish the classes from home, um, even though it was an illegal trespass, you know, and it was just a frame. So um, they just failed me for spring 2010. And everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. I mean, you can look at, you know, public court documents and find that out. And I've also been vocal about this on social media. Um, everyone knows that. Um, everyone knows my academic uh, background. The only reason I'm not showing those three, that, those three pages, that three-page academic transcript, is because I legitimately believe that it's just a trap by WSU, another one of their dirty strategies because it wasn't in the student conic file before. I have no worries showing that if I'm allowed to share it. If I find out um, at any point that um, it is legal to share that, then I'll share it that same day. I'll show it to you that same day. I'll share it, I'll make it public on my social media that same day. I don't care one bit about people finding out about my academic transcript. Everybody knows. Um, you know, what my grades were and everybody knows. So there's, there's just nothing to hide. I have no worries. And, um, you know, I, I'm confident that you will believe me on that. Now, um, if you look at the student conduct file, you will notice that there are some black boxes covering, um, some of the email addresses, physical addresses, and phone numbers. Now, I did a little research and I had found out that when you release documents publicly, um, you're not supposed to show some of the email addresses, physical addresses, and phone numbers. So if you see any black boxes in the, um, in the student conic file, those black boxes were me. Okay, but any other redaction wasn't me. That was WSU's doing. Okay, the black boxes in the student conic file were, were my doing. That's a result of my doing. And any other redaction is the result of WSU's doing, such as acronyms for names or blanked out names. Um, and if you look at the trial transcript, you will notice that there are black boxes covering names all over the place in that trial transcript. Now, that trial transcript is exactly as WSU has provided it to me. I didn't touch that thing one bit. All those black boxes were done either by WSU and or either by WSU or Nagley reporting or both, basically. Um, I think it would be more ostensibly likely that WSU did it, but it doesn't matter. It was one of them and uh, it wasn't me. That's all I'm saying. And you can tell it was them because um, 
even the name of the person who transcribed it is covered. And I don't think there's any law that would allow them to do that. That that was obviously done because they were covering up the identity of who made that trial transcript, which was a very um, inaccurate transcript. It was a tampered with transcript. And I'm going to go into um, how Negley reporting and WCU were, were, tans- were tampering with that transcript. Um, you know, uh, uh, in a little bit later, uh, in this, uh, three hour video. Um, so that trial transcript, nothing you see there was the result of, of me. All the, that trial transcript is exactly as WSU provided to me. And that's the only version that I've ever seen. So those redactions, um, were done probably by WSU, but if not by WSU, then, um, either negatively reporting or both of them. Um, but like I said, even the, even the, the identity of who transcribed it was covered. And I don't think any law would allow them to do that. And I was going to say that, um, the redactions that WSU was doing, um, in the student conic file, I don't think there's any law that, um, enabled them to do that. It was probably not in accordance with any law, uh, because, it doesn't seem right to me how they were taking out names in certain places. It doesn't seem right. Um, one of the really suspicious things is that Adam War's name was taken out of a um, from the from line of an email, but Adam War's name was even mentioned in one of Kenneth Butterfield's emails. And what WC was obviously doing was trying to hide the identity of of somebody who would have a um, very meaningful me- a missing witness inference um, arrive out of the fact that they were not testifying. And they obviously also, because no one used the web form, they obviously also didn't uh, provide a, an official legitimate uh, report of what they were saying. It was just an, just an email. Um, so they were taking certain names out and then leaving other names in. Like Evan Heary's name is in there. Caitlin McKay's name is in there. Um, they were obviously up to no good um, in taking out certain names. You can see uh, Kate Esselbach's name was taken out of the um, student conic file in um, in a few places. And, um, you know, it was just obviously not in accordance with any real privacy or education law. WSU was obviously just doing that. Um and the trial transcript, I don't think that was in accordance with any law either, because I don't know what kind of privacy law or education law would enable them to do that. Um, all those black boxes in the trial transcript, that was obviously illegitimate. There is no law that would cover that. Now, uh, looking at the trial transcript, um, I want to turn your attention to what I call small page 28 and small page 29. You look at the trial transcript, there's four small pages inside of a larger page. There's a page number in the larger page and there's four page numbers in the smaller page. So small page 28, um, if you go to small page 28 and 29, you'll see that the transcript states that I said, I specifically said in that meeting to this, to this dean and the other deans that Evan Heary meant it as a symbol that I was the one who had you wrongfully sent to student conduct. I had been sent to student conduct over a concern of a student saying this. I said I never did that. There's a camera in the room. Please check the evidence. I never did that. And he responded like, you know, and then Lisa McIntyre interrupted and said, all right, Evan is going to testify. We can talk to him about that, all right? Now, what was happening there, and you can you can uh, continue on uh, small page 29, you see more of the interruptions, but what Lisa McIntyre was doing was interrupting me as I was uh, about to say an exonerating statement. Um, so they were trying to stop me from getting uh, false, uh, you know, talking about false uh, reports of information. They were trying to stop me from saying examples of turning of students turning in false statements about me. So you could see it on small page 28 and 29. And you can also see it um, again on small page 63. I had said he had mentioned a student reported and then Christian Withridge interrupts and says, can I make a point? And then he changes the subject. So WC was clearly um, deliberately stopping me from saying exonerating statements. Um, they were clearly 
trying to stop me from giving examples of students turning in false statements. They were trying to stop me from exonerating myself. And uh, I'm about at 30 minutes, so I'll see you in the next video. Hello again. So, on small page 95, I was about to testify about the written communication between me and Ashley Fagerly, but Lisa McIntyre and Christian Withridge stopped me and changed the subject because they didn't want me to say exonerating statements. Now, if you go to small page 72, um, I want to read to you what's listed on the uh, transcript. So this is what um, was ostensibly said, and then I'm going to tell you what was actually said. As I said, I think kids notice the use of the student conduct system. If your goal was to harass a student, I mean, this is the perfect thing. You can write anything and they have no consequences for what they say if it is proven false they are going to walk away. And if you were to, if you did dislike a person who was in your class, you could very easily write letters about them, which may be malicious or misrepresenting the factual occurrence, and they would get in trouble. Now, what I actually said was noticed with a D in the place of notice. And then I said the word said in the place of say. So I said, I think kids noticed the use of the student conduct system. And I also said, you can write anything and they have no consequences for what they said if it is proven false. So what Negley Reporting in WCU was doing was trying to make it sound like I was speaking generally just about some people abusing the student conic system, some students abusing the student conic system. Instead of um, what I actually said was... I was, I was clearly referring to that specific case, to my specific case, where I was saying students were turning in false, um, false information, and um, I wasn't speaking generally about just some situation. I was speaking specifically about um, my case, and that's exactly why negligent reporting in WSU changed noticed to notice and said to say to make it seem like I was speaking generally. But the rest of it was actually said by me. And um, what I also wanted to point out was that after all the interrupting that WSU did at that trial to stop me from you know, saying exonerating statements, um, at the most important moment that they sh that where they should have inter interrupted, the most important moment to interrupt was actually right there where um, I was saying that... Um, you know, they, th students turning in false reports have no consequences for what they said and um, that um, the students noticed the use of the student conic system and that they were obviously harassing me with it. Um, and that, of course, they would have no consequences for uh, the false information that they said. And of course, um, the... Uh, um, you know, student conic board or Christian Withridge should have said, whoa, 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 whoa. If they're, no, that's not true, David. Uh, if, if they're turning in false information, uh, they would be the ones <laughs> who would get suspended uh, or expelled, not you. Um, they're not, there is a punishment for turning in false information and they wouldn't just walk away. If, um, if, it was, if their information's proven false, they wouldn't just walk away. So um, negatively reporting in WC were clearly... Um, trying to, you know, um, make it seem like I was speaking generally, but also the student conic trial should have interrupted me there um, instead of the other interruptions. Um, if you go to a small page 50 of the trial transcript, um, you'll see a moment where something interesting happened. Now, if you look at small page 50, um, it purports that Lisa McIntyre swore in Evan Harry, but if you look uh, just a little bit below that, it purports that Lisa McIntyre said, tell us about your interactions with Mr. Brown, essentially. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know we were doing this. Hang on. We're good. Whoops. Okay, we're good. Now, she didn't actually say the two we're goods there, but she did say 
the other stuff. Um, now they added in those two weird goods, um, in my opin opinion, just to make it look a little bit less strange, because I'm gonna read it again as, as what she actually said. She said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know we were doing this. Hang on, whoops, okay. So if it just said that, it would look more peculiar. Um, so they added in the two weird goods. She didn't say those. Uh, she didn't say we're good, we're good. She didn't say those there. And um, But that moment there, the reason she was saying um, that was, which was without the two weird goods, but the reason she said that general, that, the reason she was saying something there was that that was the moment I walked in to the room. Um, Ashley Fagley testified before Evan Heary, and when I was walking back into the, the room the trial was in, from the room that they had me in from when Ashley Fagley testified, um, that's what uh that's when uh lisa mcintyre said oh i'm sorry i didn't know we were doing this hang on whoops okay so what she was ostensibly saying was um oh i, I didn't know david would be in the same room as evan Heary. oh uh i didn't know we were doing it this way and then um then uh you know the trial goes forward so do you really believe they swore in evan Heary? and it just so happened to be right before i walked in no, they probably didn't swear him in. That's probably exactly why they bring in Evan Heary before they bring back the defendant. And how would Lisa McIntyre have no idea what's going on? You know, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm the judge of the trial and I don't know what's going on. It's like, yeah, right. Um, so um, they probably didn't swear in Evan Heary and they probably didn't swear in Ash Fagley because... Um, like I said, I, the phone that I, the phone in the room that I was in when Ashley Fagley testified wasn't working until she started the um, until the cross examination started. Until she started giving uh, the cross examination answers, and when the you know when the cross examination started, when the questions were, uh, the when the whole thing started, when the questions started, and she started answering. Um, but it didn't work during her testimony, and it didn't work when they ostensibly swore her in. Um, it didn't start working until the cross-examination began. Now, um, so I never heard them swear in Ashley Fagley, and I never heard them swear in Evan Heary. So I don't believe that they did. I believe that they um, had that whole thing strategized. They obviously brought in Evan Heary first, and then they um, brought in me after he was already there so that later they could just write down that they swore him in Um when he uh, probably wasn't actually sworn in. Now, two things to say to back that uh, theory up is that if you look at the final decision letter, um, the final decision letter never explicitly relies on the two students' testimony. And you would think that if you were trying to convict somebody, you would quote you know, some of the uh, uh, testimony um, that uh, from the students that testified against them, you, you would think that they would do that, um, but they didn't. Uh, they went five pages of, um, you know, saying other things. And um, so I think it's it's quite uh, indicative of the, the, the allegation that they didn't swear in those two students. I think it's quite obvious they, they probably didn't swear them in. And the, in the Robert Barber uh, case in 2016, um, him and his lawyers claimed that WSU only had some of their witnesses against Robert Barber uh, actually under oath. The rest were not uh, sworn in. So that's probably a classic strategy that WSU does all the time, is using unsworn uh, testimony so that um, they could try, you know, weasel themselves out of getting held accountable for framing people. Um, you know, it, it's obviously some sort of strategy that they're doing. Um, so they probably did not swear in Evan Heary or Ashley Fagley, which is obviously indicative of a frame. Um, on small page 43, there was a moment where one of the jurors ostensibly indicated that he worked with Ashley Fagerly and knew her. Now I wasn't in the room at the time, so I don't know for sure what happened, but if that is um, what uh, if that is what happened, that would obviously be um, you know very improper because the student conduct board is not, not supposed to 
know a witness um, very well. You know, the WSU claimed that they screened the student conduct board for bias. If somebody works with and knows actually Fagerly, um, that's obviously bizarre. I don't even know if it actually happened, though, because I wasn't in the room at the time. Um, but um, anyway, on small page 31, Lisa McIntyre said, so if you have something that hasn't isn't brought out in the rest of the test of, you know, evidence, then that's what you need to focus on, okay? Now, the transcript states that she said testimony, but she actually said, um, she said it like that. She did like test of, you know, evidence. She, so she didn't finish the word testimony, but they put testimony. But most importantly to note is that um, aside from that, that she did say that, that quote that I just read you, um, but yeah, she didn't finish the word testimony when she said it. She had like test of, you know, evidence. But anyway, she was clearly telling me not to write cross-examination questions that related to, um, you know, evidence or, you know, possibly to testimony too. Uh, but either way, um, you know, that's, that's obviously horrible advice. She was trying to get me to write, you know, like bad cross-examination questions. She was trying to steer me in the wrong direction, obviously. Um, now, you're probably wondering... How is David Brown so certain as to what was said at the trial? You know, how, how, do, how would I know for certain, for sure, what exactly was said at the trial? Now, here's what I'll, here's what I'll tell you. Um, I'm not sure whether it would be legal for a defendant in a student conduct trial to have a small recording device in their coat pocket that's running throughout the entire trial. Now, having said that, I'll just um, tell you to take my word for it, that what I'm telling you exactly was said is what exactly was, what exactly was said. And um, also keep in mind, I'm, I'm obviously also under penalty of perjury telling you exactly what was said and not what this trial transcript says. So that's another reason to believe me. Um, so if you go to small page four, transcript states that I said, may I put my laptop open to the law? But I said into the law. I said, may I put my laptop into the law? So they're trying to, you know, change the meaning of the sentence there. On small page seven, uh, the transcript reads that a juror said they were in and then it says inaudible in curved brackets, but it wasn't inaudible what that person said. What he said was they were in an opposite order and uh, negatively reporting in WSU um, took that statement out and put inaudible when it wasn't actually inaudible. Um, he said that very clearly and um, They, they were trying to, you know, cover up how uh, ridiculous, um, you know, uh, one of their documents looked. They were trying to make the, the trial look less uh, ridiculous. Um, now, that brings up an important uh, moment here. If you look at the trial transcript, you will notice that there were 20 separate moments of purportedly inaudible speech. Now, a trial that only lasts about two and a half hours, um, you know, and that's even, um, you know, adding in the times where they were, you know, off the record. But generally speaking, a trial that lasts a few hours, you know, um, you would never get 20 inaudible, separate inaudible moments of speech. You just wouldn't. That's not how recording technology works. That's not how reality works. It just wouldn't happen. Um, you know, to think that the second largest university in the state, um, you know, what kind of uh, recording technology do you think they'd be using for a university trial? Um, it was professional recording technology. And what we, we were inside of uh, an office room that had 
one large table, like a conference table, and we were all sitting around it. And there was a recording device in the center of the table with multiple microphones pointing out at us. Now, what kind of, you know, technology do you think the second largest university in the state would be using for um, a uh, university trial? Obviously, um, you would never get 20 inaudible moments of speech on that recording equipment. It's just not how technology works. It's not how reality works. I mean, even a basic understanding of of uh, technology um, can lead you to the conclusion that even a very uh, cheap, basic microphone just situated in the middle of the table um, while people are speaking, um, you, you know, even with that, you'd be lucky to find one or two inaudible moments of speech after, you know, a trial that took, you know, about two and a half hours. Um, a trial that took, you know, not that long, really. Um, and they weren't even alleging that the inaudible, um, moments of speech came from just like one person who maybe we could theorize would just be a quiet talker or a muffled speaker or something like that. No, they were claiming that it came from a variety of people. So 20 inaudible moments of speech, obviously a lie. You'd be lucky to get one or two, especially on re professional recording equipment. Um, it's just not going to happen. You know, we were in uh, the French administration building in the Office of Student Conduct in the evening, you know, in Pullman. It was it was uh, totally quiet, um, except for our tucked away office that we were in. You just wouldn't get 20 inaudible moments of speech. They were obviously lying. They were taking out important information and putting an audible there to try and make it seem like, um, you know, it was inaudible when they were actually just covering stuff up. Now... Um, on small page 10 and 11, you could see that the transcript states, I can prepare questions, and then you see an audible, but what I actually said was, I can prepare questions for David Sprott, and I phrased it like a question. So they took that out, put in audible. Um, on small page 25, um, transcript uh, purports that, um, Lisa McIntyre said, I used the words that I think are on point, okay? But what she actually said was use. She didn't say used. She said, I use the words that I think are on point, okay? So they were trying to make it seem like Lisa McIntyre was only rewording that one question, when actually what she was saying was just generally that she rewords questions when she thinks they need to be rewarded. She said, I use the words that I think are on point, okay? So they were trying to make it seem like she was only talking about that one question when she was somewhat speaking generally, actually. Um, now, if you look on small page 27 on line two, I said a figurative handgun to answer what Lisa McIntyre was wondering. And what I said was audible. So I was like a figurative handgun like this. Um, Evan Harry had gone like that. Um, and he had done it to his own head. He went like like that to his own head. Um, and uh, they took out a figurative handgun, which I, what I said was totally audible, but they took out a figurative handgun so you would think, oh, what are they, what are they talking about, a gun? What are they talking about? Uh, so that you wouldn't quite uh, understand what was being said there and what was being talked about. Now, if you look on small page 52, um, transcript purports that Evan said, the teacher was just talking about key performance indicators, business intelligence. I mean, just normal. You know, what's going on with the Patriots? What are, then it says inaudible. But what, it, what he actually said was, what are they in the industry of? Now, they took out that last part there because... Um, his statement was kind of bizarre, and they didn't want you to notice how bizarre his statement was. Because I'm going to read, read it to you as, as it actually was, as, as what he actually said. The teacher was just talking about key performance indicators, business intelligence. I mean, just normal. You know, what's going on with the Patriots? What are they in the industry of? So, you know, it's a kind of a weird statement. It's like, wait a second, a 500-level MAS class, you know? Why it was weird to just jump from those kind of um, it was weird for him to kind of act like talking about the Patriots and what are they in the industry of as if that was a normal thing to be talking about 
um, and at 500 level MIS class, um, it just, it just looked a little weird. And I think they recognize that. So they, they put in audible there when it was actually audible. Um, you know, they were clearly just misleading the audience. Um, now, um, Uh, if you look on small page 56, uh, one of my favorite, this is probably one of my favorite alterations that they did. This is like one of the dirtiest ones, in my opinion, this probably is the dirtiest one. Um, I'm going to read to you what the, uh, transcript states. Um, and, um, here's, here's what the transcript states. It states, I'm down in my office, but I used to work at the Cougar phonetic back during my undergrad. Now, I'm going to read to you what he actually said. I'm down in my office, but I used to work at the Coug back during my undergrad. Now, he said the Coug. He didn't say the Cougar. Why would you put the Cougar and then phonetic in curved brackets? Um, why, why would you put the Cougar if he said the Coug? Why wouldn't you just put what he actually said? Um, you know, uh, that is totally misleading to put it the way they did. And if you've, if you've ever transcribed something, you know that like the key is to not be misleading. That's, that's the whole purpose is to do anything, but be misleading, but be misleading. You would put the coog, you would just put what he actually said. And he did, they didn't capitalize the T the T is capitalized in the coog. You can look it up. That's the name of the, uh, um, that's the name of the establishment, the Coug. It's capitalized even when it's not at the beginning of a sentence, the T that is. And, um, you know, so the T should have been capitalized and the C and it should have been Coug, not Cougar. Now, um, what they were doing was trying to, uh, throw you off and I'll show you why they were trying to throw you off here. Cause if you look, um, where it says my office in that same sentence, now, I want you to go to um, open a, open a tab uh, on your internet uh, browser and Google my office bar Pullman. Now, what you're going to find is that you could probably even just Google my office Pullman, but what you're going to find is that there's a bar called my office in Pullman. What Evan Heary was talking about was working in my office in Pullman, the bar. And I know that because I saw him there twice when I was in graduate school with him. He worked at my office while he had a 20 hour a week assistantship. And they were trying to make you think that he was talking maybe about his assistantship. Like, oh, I work, you know, my, my, my uh, office job, the assistantship job now, but I used to work at a bar during undergrad. And they even tried to throw you off there by saying the cougar instead of the coog. Um, but they were trying to make you think that he was talking about his office job, the assistantship. That's clearly what they were trying to do because again, anyone who's ever transcribed something, you know, that, um, if ever anything doesn't quite seem right, it's like I'm down in my office, but they were just talking about working in bars. What does my office and Pullman and bars have to do with each other? And you would Google it, you'd find the answer. Um, so they were clearly, uh, you know, lower casing that on purpose, uh, to mislead the audience. Now, this brings up a really interesting point. Now, you're probably noticing an interesting paradox. You're, you're probably noticing, you know, why would the students who had um, the most tuition waiving jobs uh, be getting the best grades? Because everyone knows, you know, the more jobs you have, the more time you're working jobs, um, the harder it is to get high grades. So it's kind of a paradox that the students with the most tuition waiving jobs were also getting the best grades. Now in Evan's case, he worked a 20 hour week assistantship while working in my office. Um, and that's uh, ludicrous. You would never want to work, you know, more than 20 hours a week in, an M in a full-time MBA program, a full-time on-campus MBA program. MBA programs are well known for having extreme, extreme workloads. Now, why would Evan Heary even, even fathom getting a job in the bar uh, on top of um, having a 20 hour week graduate assistantship? Because he knew that they were just passing him no matter what, 
no matter what he did. He knew that the grades were being handed out politically. And think about the, uh, if you watch that other video that's approximately 30 minutes, the one about the Facebook messages, um, you know, why would Kate Esselbach be looking for a 10 hour assistantship on top of her 20 hour? Because what she had was a 20 hour assistantship. Um, it's just crazy to think that you would want to work more than, you know, 20 hours a week. Um, on top of, you know, doing your uh, full-time MBA program, it just, it just be very difficult to pull off um, all the way through a semester or whatever. Um, so you're probably noticing that, that that's uh, bizarre that these students were just piling on the jobs, but they were still doing really well in the program. In Evan's case, yeah, he was an Aryan, but he was participating in their severe harassment towards me. He was sucking up to the professors. Um, he even participated in their frame. So they were passing him, but um, it's very strange when you think about the fact that he had a 20 hour week assistantship and he was working at the bar in my office. He was a bartender and bar back, by the way, at my office. I saw him there doing that twice. And um, meanwhile, in spring 2010, I didn't even have a job. And even during spring 2010, Evan Heary was getting better grades than me. And I didn't even have a job. So there's an interesting paradox there and they didn't want you to pick up on that. Um, you know, why, why, why would someone want to work uh, so much and why would they have even fathomed, you know, that they could work so much and, um, you know, still do well in their master's program? Most people would be afraid of uh, failing out, um, but um, not the students who were doing well in the WC MBA program because they knew that grades were being handed out politically. The deans were failing who they wanted. The deans were passing who they wanted. That's how it was going. And they knew that. Um, so WC wanted to mis mislead you there. And it's also really interesting to notice this because if, if you take a look at the record, I never brought up that paradox. I never brought it up. And, um, obviously the resolution of the paradox is that WC was, um, you know, handing out grades politically, but, um, I never brought it up. So what this also shows is that WCU knows exactly what to cover up, um, they know what they're doing and they, it, they've probably heard that, um, that argument from other people they've discriminated against, uh, in the past, they probably heard people say, Hey, wait a second, you know, WCU, how are you going to tell me that I didn't get bad grade, undeserved bad grades? Um, because I also have, you know, less, uh, I have less jobs. I either have no, no job or I have only had one job. Meanwhile, some people have multiple jobs, um, and they're doing better. Um, they probably heard that a million times. So they know what to cover up. They already know how to go there. Um, I want to check my uh, um, preview cam for the time here. Um, okay, I got about two minutes. Um, my timer here on the side uh, is uh, was off by one minute. So I wanted to set that timer to the timer in the preview screen of the camera. Um, talk about two minutes. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, so that was, that was very, very, um, obvious, obviously done as a strategy by Negley reporting and WSU. Um, and you know, it was both of them working together because Negley reporting just knew too much. Um, so obviously, um, you know, they were working together to do this. Um, if you go to small page 58, um, transcript states that Mr. Brown said, um, ostensibly said, uh, and there, if there is a question that strikes you as odd, I would be glad to answer why, because there are some other, but I actually said underlying and instead of other, I said underlying instead of other. And on small page 58, also you'll see, um, I ostensibly said, if it seems random, it may not be once I inaudible. But what I actually said was, once I am allowed to speak. Now, what WCU and Negley reporting was covering up there was an interesting flaw in what they were doing because they had me testify after the other three witnesses. But then when they were looking at my cross examination questions, Lisa McIntyre was looking at them, that is, uh, she was often saying, Oh, I don't see how this is relevant. This, I don't see how this is relevant. I'm not going to ask this. I'm not going to ask that. I'm going to reword this, reword that. Um, but of course that's bizarre because if I was going to testify last, how is she to say what, what's relevant and what's not if, 
uh, she doesn't know what my uh, statement uh, would be. And so they were covering up that that flaw in what WC was doing, because obviously, you know, she shouldn't be throwing out cross examination questions saying she doesn't quite get it. She doesn't quite get it. She doesn't quite get it. If um, or and rewording the other ones, if she's if she's going to argue that she doesn't understand because um, I would testify last. Anyway, we're about at uh, 30 minutes. So continue the next video. Hello again. So if you um, if you go to small page 64, um, you'll see that the transcript states and at least a few others who she, but what was actually said was whose. What was actually said was and at least a few others whose and at least a few others whose was what was said. If you look at small page 73, uh, transcript states, most people at Holman do, and then phonetic is in curved brackets, but um, what was actually said was most people in Pullman do. Um, so negatively reporting in WC, we're trying to make it seem like um, you know a, a different group of people were being spoken about. Um, on small page 77, um, transcript states, there was never an insulation, but um, what was actually said was insinuation. I said, there was never an insinuation. That's what I said. So they altered uh, insinuation, turned it into insulation um, to change the meaning of what was said there. Um, on small page 82, um, I'm going to read you what the transcript states. Um, and then I'll tell you what was actually said. Um, transcript states. Um, so it was um, transcript was uh, purportedly purporting that I said um, the statement I made was not in this manner, and I have in this document other evidence as well as other witness testimony which I did not follow through to show that my words dot 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 now what was actually said was this the statement i made was not in this manner and i hope that this document other evidence as well as other witness testimony which did not follow through show that my words dot 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 now what they did was they changed i hope that this document and what would have been a comma um, after document because of the pause there um they changed that to, and I have in this document, and there's no comma there. So it looks like I'm saying, it looks like I said, and I have in this document other evidence. But what I actually said was, and I hope that this document, other evidence, as well as other witness testimony. So they were trying to make it uh, seem like I was just talking about what was in the document. But what I was saying was, I have the document, other evidence, as well as uh, other witness testimony. And then I said, which did not follow through. I didn't say which I did not follow through. I said which did not follow through. And after through, they put the word to. I didn't say to show that my words. I said show that my words. So as you could see, they were um, altering uh, altering what was actually said. They, they were altering what was actually said there in a major way. Um, that So yeah, that... That was a, a major alteration that Negley reporting and WC did. Um, if you go to small page 83, transcript states, WC standards of conduct for students. I actually said WSU, not WC. Um, some more examples of that same thing. If you look on, um, again, on small page 83, transcript states, WC 504-26-204. I actually said WAC 504-26-204. Um, again, on small page 83, transcript states WC 504-26-203. I actually said WAC 504-26-203. On small page 84, you'll see WC 504-26-207. I actually said WAC 504-26-207. And uh, 
if you look at small page 84, again, you'll see, um, if you again look at small page 84, you'll see WC standards of conduct, but I actually said WSU standards of conduct there. And um, if you look on small page 85, um, it says WC College of Business, but I actually said WSU College of Business. So as you can see, they um, they were claiming I said WC in the place of WSU and WC in the place of w, WAC, but I actually did say um, those things correctly. I said WSU in the places I just described to you, and I said WAC in the places I just described to you. Um, so they were trying to make it look like I didn't know what I was talking about. One of the funniest things is that even if I did say those, I said WC in all those places, which I didn't, but even if I did, um, you would have seen a moment where they would have interrupted and they would have said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, you know, we're charging you with uh, alleged violations of WACs or, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're alleging that you uh, broke the stand the WSU standards of conduct for students. Um you know, they would have said something there if I wasn't saying the correct things. Um, so you could tell that they're lying. Um, if you look at small page 87, you'll see the transcript states Professor Katie Joshi, but what was actually said was KD Joshi. So they were covering the professor's identity. Um, if you look at small page 90, transcript says frame of though, what was actually said was frame of thought. If you look at small page 95, you'll see um, I stated her. What was actually said was I stated here. If you look at small page 98, you'll see unacceptable and isolated, but was what was actually said was unacceptable and not isolated. Um, so as you can see, um, negatively reporting in WSU altered the transcript in a variety of ways. Um, to cover up a lot of things and um it, it, you know i just uh i remind you i'm under penalty of perjury and i what i'm telling you is not what was meant to have been said in those moments i'm saying what was for sure said um for sure said so i'm i'm absolutely certain that what i have told you was actually said in the in uh, the foregoing moments that I described um, was, is actually the truth. That's, that was what was actually said. It was totally audible. There's no confusing it. And um, they clearly uh, tampered with uh, the record here to try and um, make it seem different than what actually happened um, at that trial. Now, um, one thing I wanted to draw your attention to was uh, relating to the federal lawsuit I filed against WSU. Um, I filed it about five years ago. And um, if you take a look at the complaint that I filed, it would um, definitely um, explain a lot to you as to what happened. And what I want you to notice is um if anything that I was saying there wasn't true, I would have been prosecuted for perjury and I would have been sued for defamation. Um, but I never was. I was never prosecuted for perjury and I was never sued for defamation because what I was saying was true. And there was nothing that um, anyone could do about it. And the same thing goes here. What I'm telling you is the truth. It's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'm saying this under penalty of perjury, and because it's a public statement, I'm at risk for defamation if anything I'm saying is not true. The reason that neither of those options are going to happen, you're not going to see a prosecution, a prosecution for perjury, you're not going to see me get sued for defamation. And the reason for that is because um, what I'm telling you is true, and there's nothing anyone um, can do about it. Um, now, you're probably wondering about the uh, criminal trespass uh trial. So I was prosecuted for criminal trespass um, back in 2010. Um, but I was pronounced not guilty because the WSU trespass was a, a legally invalid trespass. It was an illegal trespass. It, it wasn't a legal trespass. It was an illegal trespass. So um, I was not guilty. 
And um, I represented myself because I didn't trust the public defenders there. I feel I made the right choice because if I had a public defender, they would have just been a public pretender and I would have ended up with a um, you know, criminal trespass uh, conviction. They wouldn't have argued that the criminal that the trespass was uh, invalid. They would have argued that um, you know it just was a legal trespass. They wouldn't have brought up um, you know the frame. So since I argued it was a legally invalid trespass, I got off. Um, so the situation for that was that in. Um, in May, I was looking for a part-time job. So I thought maybe I should get a part-time job in a restaurant. Seems like you could make, you know, decent money in a college town doing that. And uh, I had forgot that the Palouse Ridge Golf Course uh, still counted as, as campus. It was still counted as a campus property, a WSU property. I had forgot about that. And I applied for a job in, at the restaurant there called Banyan's. So, um, I walked, I walked in to apply for the job and, um, it was lunch. There were some people there and I, uh, was waiting for the host to come back to the host desk. I was waiting in the waiting area and just my luck, uh, Cheryl Oliver walked in. Cheryl Oliver saw me, I saw her and we just, um, you know, coexisted. We just, we didn't say anything to each other. We, uh, just kind of ignored each other or like faux ignored each other. Um, cause we were both aware of, of who the other person was. And, um, host comes back to the desk. I say, Hey, it was just, um, looking to see if you guys had any openings. Um, I'd like to apply for a job. She said, um, well, it's lunch rush right now. Why don't you come back in a few hours when there's less people? And um, so I did. And I, I guess Cheryl Oliver was just meeting some friends there that day for lunch. And um, so I left and went home, came back in a couple hours. Um, restaurant had less people and went to the, the host desk. And the hostess said... Um, Oh, the manager's really busy right now. Why don't you give me, why don't you give me your resume and I'll have them uh, contact you, um, you know, uh, if there's, if there's anything uh, we could do for you. And um, so I gave him the resume, go back home. Not long after, doorbell rings. I open the door. There's two cops there. They said, were you at Banyan's today? I said, yeah. They said, okay, well, we're going to arrest you. Um, they arrested me and took me to Colfax jail. I pay 500 bucks to bail myself out and then um, go home. The trial wasn't till August. So um, I stayed in Pullman for just a little bit longer, but then went home to my parents' house and waited for the trial uh, to happen. And then just, you know, stayed in the motel uh, in Moscow while the, while I went to the, um, you know, the trial and the, um, other hearings for it. Um, and just, you know, drove back and forth basically. Um, so as you can see, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, it was just an accident, but, um, I ended up getting a not guilty verdict because, um, it was a legally invalid trespass and there's nothing they could do. Um, And, um, so after the, um, so after all that, you know, after the whole illegality, all the illegal things that happened to me, um, I was kind of unfortunate in that I didn't have a family who would, um, help me file a lawsuit or lawsuits to, uh, resolve the matters. Um, and it was just a really unfortunate situation. I got framed, harassed, given undeserved bad grades, um, illegally fired, even maliciously prosecuted, um, and conspired against. And, you know, there was a whole lot of corruption uh, from others towards me. 
And, uh, you know, I just didn't have a family who supported me. I ba basically, my family was scared off, primarily my father. Um, my father's kind of a coward and he got scared off and, um, my mom's just kind of a selfish, callous person. And it was just a really horrible situation to be in that circumstance and to just so happen to have a family that maybe wasn't the best family to have in a situation like that. Um, it just was a very bad situation altogether. And my brother basically just sided with my parents because they have money and I don't. Um, he wants their inheritance money. He likes the money that they provide to him even through his adult life. And um, he likes that side. And um, it was just really unfortunate. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm estranged from my family. I don't speak to them anymore, in other words. And um, you wouldn't either <laughs> if, uh, um, if, you know, your family did that to you. Uh, you wouldn't talk to them either. And, you know, the, um, the scenario of what happened to me is basically where nearly all, uh, family estrangements are derived from, uh, basically almost everyone who's estranged from their family has the same story. Uh, the parents just screwed them over and it was unfair. Um, I mean, my parents had more than enough money to do it. It's just that they were, uh, afraid to do it. They didn't want to do it. And, um, it, it was just a really unfortunate situation, but my parents kind of screwed me. Uh, in many ways, I think my parents ruined my life by not doing that. And, um, you know, that's what, co that's what courts are for. They're, they're there to be used. The, uh, the situation that I was forced into was a situation that the law is meant to resolve. And to not do that is just a tragedy. So, um, you know, I just got screwed over. And, and most people who are estranged from their family have the, it's the exact same song and dance. When you just look at the situation objectively, and I'm not saying you need to try and take the side of the person who's estranged, just look at the situation objectively. And what you see in almost all um, family estrangements is that the estranged person was basically just screwed over by their parents. And uh, the siblings just side with the parents for inheritance money. And that's basically where all, not, not all, but nearly all, uh, family estrangements come from is the exact same thing as what happened to me. Um, so it's pretty sad. Um, but yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened to me. And that's, that's, um, where most people who are estranged from their family come from. Just even if you just ob objectively t look at the situation, you don't need to try and take a side, just objectively look at it. And you notice basically that uh, a strange person just got screwed over by their parents. And then the siblings just side with the parents because of inheritance money. It's really sad. That's, um, that's exactly what happened to me too. And um, my, my parents, um, and to an extent, my brother, even though it's kind of just like, um, sycophantic that he's even doing it, but, um, that he's even arguing it. I mean, um, but my parents argue that it's my fault that I was framed. They, they, their argument is that I must have done something, even if it was only just socially wrong, um, in order for them to do it to me. And that's obviously a specious argument. And that's, uh, the argument my parents and my brother use, um, and that's obviously a lame argument. That's a specious argument. Um, that's victim blaming. Obviously, um, it's no one's fault that they get framed for things that they didn't do. The only thing we should ever hold people accountable for is what they actually did do. We should never be justifying people breaking a variety of federal and state laws to frame somebody. That is crazy. And um, that's what my family argues. And... Um, they also blame me for not talking to them. They think it's wrong that I uh, do not speak to them anymore. But it's like, what am I supposed to do? You know, how is it my fault for not talking to them after what they did to me? They ruined my entire life and they expect me to show up at, you know, uh, the dinner table and just be like, hey, mom and dad, don't worry about it. Like, no way. That's pathetic. You can't go out like that. You can't do that. You got to walk away. You know, you don't really have a choice. That's one of those situations where you don't really have a choice. You have to walk away from your family. If they do that to you, uh, as my parents did to me, 
my uh, family did to me, um, you got to walk away. There's, <laughs> there's no other option. Uh, you just got to walk. And, um, you know, you can't let, uh, you can't let anybody, your family, anybody get away with, with doing that to you. You got to just walk away from them. So they blame me not only for this, uh, frame happening, which is a specious argument in a variety of ways, but, uh, they, um, also blame me for refusing to talk to them. They think it's wrong that I refuse to talk to my family. And, um, it's obviously not wrong given what they did. And, um, it's also ridiculous that, you know, they're, they're victim blaming me for the, the frame situation. And then they're also blaming me unjustly for not speaking to them. Um, and like I said, it's a specious argument to say, oh, people did it to you. Therefore they must be right. Because first of all, what they did was unjustifiable. There's no way that you could justify what they did. Um, you know, they broke a variety of federal and state laws. They were obviously wrong. Uh, no one on earth agrees that people should be being framed for things they didn't do. And um, they, they are, uh, my, my family often says that, you know, it was uh, that I got ganged up on. They say that I got ganged up on. And, you know, so I must have done something wrong. And it's like, you know, that's so <laughs> specious for a variety of reasons. Uh, like I said, it's unjustifiable what they did. But also it's 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 a mischaracterization to call it like a gang up situation because that almost makes you think that the students were like, oh, hey, I got an idea, you know, but that's obviously not what happened. It was a methodical frame. It was a methodical conspiracy. I was marked for death from the moment I went into that program. I was the one and only Jew in an anti-Semitic program where they were racially discriminating to the nth degree. Uh, what amount of social skills is going to save you from that? You know, if you're in a neo-Nazi institution and you're Jewish, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see anyone victim blame the Jew in a situation like that. Um, you know, that is a specious argument. And, um, you know, those students were trapped in a situation of duress. They were trapped in a box. Those professors had control of their entire futures. Those professors had demonstrated um, they were willing to do and did do, uh, you know, undeserved bad grades for anyone who defied them and for the people who they wanted to discriminate against. They had um, demonstrated that they were willing to give undeserved good grades to the people who participated in the illegal conduct that WSU wanted them to do. Um, they were giving undeserved bad grades and undeserved good grades for not only the racial discrimination reasons, but also for participating in what they were doing. Um, and they also pressured those students. They told them to do it. That's not a gang up situation. Um, they told those uh, people to do it. Um, you know, in many cases, those students were taking out tens of thousands of dollars in student loans. They're in a situation of duress and they were being pressured and incentivized to do it. Um, you know, the professors had demonstrated they were willing to severely harass people. Um, WSU, um, you know, but from deans, administrative employees and professors and anybody who could pull strings obviously got police, uh, WCU police to participate in the, illegal, in the illegal conduct as well by getting me arrested in front of everyone, um, in front of all my, uh, nearly all, I guess, of my um, cohorts uh, for something I didn't even do, for the Ashley Fagerly uh, shoulder touch, which was just a shoulder tap, not a rub, as she states, it was just a tap. And... Um, you know, they had, they had demonstrated that they were willing to sink to the levels of truest evil you could imagine. They were framing somebody in front of everyone, and they were, they were demonstrating that they were willing to break any federal and state laws imaginable um, to say that, you know, those students, uh, you know, it was a gang-up situation. I think that is so insanely misleading. Number one, what they did was unjustifiable, and no one in their right mind would argue that it was justifiable. Number two... Um, their, my parents and my brother's description of the situation is absolutely incorrect. That is a totally misleading situation. Deans were pulling these students into back rooms and telling them what to do. 
that is not a gang up situation. And they were, the whole program was holding meetings about me without me even there, without my presence, just holding meetings about me. Uh, without me there. What amount of social skills on earth could possibly save you from a situation like that? That's the type of thing where you just got to get a lawyer um, and you got to fight through the courts. That's your, only, that's your only option. And no one should ever be victim blaming anyone over a situation like that. And for someone to victim blame their own son or daughter in a situation like that, uh, you would have to be a bad parent to do that. Um, now, if you look through the student conduct file, you'll notice that there was um, a few moments where it, it, it was like I was blaming myself for certain things happening to me. And you, I'm confident that as you look at that, you'll agree that I'm innocent and that um, the way it may look at first uh, glance isn't the truth. Um, I'm sure you'll agree with me that I'm innocent of, um, of everything that WCU alleged. And um, I'm sure you'll notice that I was kind of like blaming myself in certain situations, blaming myself for things that weren't really my fault. Um, I was blaming myself for things that I shouldn't have been blaming myself for. And um, basically where I had learned um, to do that was from growing up with my parents. My parents would often blame things on me that weren't actually my fault. And I learned from a very young age that if I just kind of say I'm sorry, and if I just say it's my fault, if I just say you're right, if I just say it won't happen again, if I just say um, that it was my fault, it won't happen again, I'm sorry, and it would just resolve from there. Everything would just resolve and I'd be back on my parents' good side and everything like that. Um, so I'd learned that growing up and, um, you know, that's where I, I, you know, learned to do that really, uh, stupid thing to do. And I'm confident that, that you'll agree that that's where I got that from my parents because well, look at me right now. Uh, my parents are doing it right now. They're blaming me for something that's not my fault. And they're doing like a holdout on me because even though I refuse to talk to them, they're also like, they're doing their part too. It's not like they're, they're doing anything for me. I haven't, I haven't heard from them in a long time. And I, um, you know, I, I don't get anything from my parents and I haven't for, for years. Um, so they're, they're playing their part too, but they're blaming me and try, they're basically trying to get me to apologize to them um, for not only the frame happening, but, um, you know, succumb to their uh, their position of they shouldn't have had to file a lawsuit that I shouldn't feel like they should have had to. They're trying to get me to also, you know, um, uh, talk to them and and blame myself for refusing to talk to them. They're trying to shift the blame onto me when um it's not my fault okay none of this is my fault it's not my fault i was framed it's not my fault that other people broke a variety of federal and state laws it's not my fault that they did something wrong to me and it's not my fault that my parents didn't want to help me because my father i mean he's he is kind of a coward i mean wh why would you believe what my parents say if you know for my life, uh, everything was was very good. My parents helped me go to college. My parents helped me in many ways. And it all was good up until that particular moment, right at the same moment that my dad would have had to go up against all these you know, wealthy uh, people with clout, right at that same moment that things got politically uh, scary, that's when all of a sudden his son doesn't deserve things. Because um, you know, look at everything else my parents had done up until then. My life was just like most Americans. It was good. I had what I thought was, was a loving family. So why would everything have been fine up until 24? You know, it's quite interesting how that all correlates right with the moment that my parents um, would have had to do something uh, scary. And in, and in just my particular family, it just kind of um, was the way that my, my father kind of um, makes a lot of those decisions and my mom just goes with it because she, she, she wants to preserve her marriage. She really likes... Uh, her marriage. Um, so anyways, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, the whole situation with my family and 
it also directly relates to that, um, you know, kind of blaming myself for things that weren't my fault. And I'm confident that you will see that and know that I'm still innocent, even though you see that in the student conic file. Um, I'm confident that you'll agree I'm innocent. And, um, you know, anyways, I just want to uh, end this video by saying, you know, I, this, I'm not, uh, ending the conversation per se. I've given you the all the material you need to be able to conclude beyond any doubt that this was simply a frame. And um, if you ever have any questions for me, just let me know and I will answer them. I'm always open to talking about this. Just um, contact me, uh, add me on social media, uh, you know, get involved with my life and I will always, and even without that, I'll always answer questions. And um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally open. Just get in, just get involved with my life, get to know me. And, um, you know, I talk about this all the time and post about this all the time on social media. Um, so anyways, thank you for your time.